Get it. Woo! S-D-P-P. The Steve Dangle Podcast. With your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go! Well, hello there. Steve Dangle back from vacation. Jesse and I are about to be on vacation. It's our last episode until the week of August 30th. In fact, our next episode will be September 1st. Can you imagine? August 31st. August 31st. It will not be. It will be (laughs) September. It will not be. It will be the day before. There you go. (laughs) Mm. Um, But you know, listen, it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be great because uh, people have been asking what the schedule is after that. So in September, after that first week back, uh, we will go to two episodes a week. And then as soon as the season starts or maybe just before, we will go to three per week. And I'm just going to ask you to reserve in your calendar the first Saturday where there is Toronto Maple Leafs hockey, where there is NHL hockey. Nothing Tell us to, why! Tell us why! Nothing to announce Tell us yet. why! <laughs> Tell us why now! <laughs> I can't. But Fine. let's Fine. just say we would like to get together. Let's go hang out. Let's go on a date. It'll be sexy. Let's have some fun. Okay. Well, now I'm, I don't want to. No? Um, no? Did date scare you? It's it's the you use the sex word and it made me uncomfortable. Did it? Like it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's tough. It's, it's a good thing you've never had it. You know. Wow. You know. <laughs> Remember when people used to call you a virgin and you were married? <laughs> like the Steve Dangle virgin. It's like <laughs> we're like yeah, okay. <laughs> we're like twenty eight. <laughs> yeah. Next level up. Like religious. Like mm-hmm. we no we wait like for fifty years of marriage. That's right. You got to earn it. Also, we've had kids before we did it. So there you go. Uh, now, uh, we've got a few things to cover in the show. Some are fun. Some are tough. We've got the, um, the Leafs All or Nothing Amazon preview came out. It will come out October 1st, by the way. Everybody's kind of wondering about that. Um, we're going to talk about the Leafs and the hiring and firing of Dusty Emo. Um, <clears throat> Evander Kane situation, which is very interesting. And a very interesting breakdown uh, about the salary cap and where it's going over the next few years. You might have heard that it's going up, and that might be sort of true, but it's sort of also not true. And you didn't, I didn't realize until I read this, and this is from Frank Cervalli of Daily Faceoff, didn't realize how deep in debt with the owners the players are. This is crazy. And the way that this is set up is unbelievable to me. And it just goes to show that during that 2004 lockout, the star players that got together and allowed for this particular CBA to be signed let down every single generation afterwards. And every player that plays hockey now should be asking those guys what the hell they were thinking. It's, it's insane. We got to talk about it. It's crazy. But we're going to start with the Leafs all or nothing. So um, this is an Amazon documentary. And the whole idea was this year, I think, that um, the Leafs were going for it. Right. They were going for it. They were going to spend firsts at the deadline and potentially two fourths as well. I had, I had such a nice vacation. I know. So and so, nice. you know, <laughs> so now we're going to watch it together and sort of live react to it. Is that cool? Should we do that? Jesse, are you good to do Let's it? do it. Let me, uh, let me share my screen with you guys on the Zoom call and uh, let's have some fun. Okay. Steve, you said off camera, there's a lot of Justin Hall in that. Yeah, welcome to Justin Hall or Justin Hall, the documentary about Justin Hall on the Justin Halls and friends. I, I think we know now why they protected him in the expansion draft. Because he's half the duck. He is He is the key. He's the host, man. He's, yep, pretty much. And look, there's, there's so many interesting little micro decisions like in that trailer because you're, you're trying to sell this thing, right? Mm-hmm. So... Number one, I think the release date of October 1st, a lot of people are pissed it took so long. I think it's brilliant. It's perfect. It's perfect because the <laughs> season starts something like 15, 16 days later, a little over two weeks. Huh? So you're going to get people hype. Here's the Herculean task they have. You have to get Leaf fans hype. And you're going to use it by highlighting Zach Bogosian twice. Um, Zach Hyman, a lot of people were talking about that. He's in this and that's going to be horrible to watch the first save we saw in that trailer is frederick anderson Mm -hmm. that's going to be interesting we're going to have to we're going to watch the leafs slowly come to the realization they're never going to have freddie in their net again um and not one of the stars spoke a word in that promo no marner no matthews no nylander no Tavares. 
Yeah, you saw Tavares. Well, Tavares doesn't say much anyway. I don't remember seeing Riley's face. Oh, that's a good question. Was he in it? I didn't see Brody. Right. There was a, a millisecond of Simmons. I don't think I saw Spetz's face. Can I, I tell mean, you right now, I Ooh, Jesse, think you're, you're, you're a little hot, my friend. A little, a little hot, hot again? Still hot. Yeah. All right. All right. Man's Is it better hot. now? Um, no. No. It's just no. way hot. I'm, I'm turning down. I'm, there you go. Hey, hey, that's a little better. All right. Can I tell you right now that I think we might be disappointed by this? Because uh, <laughs> lease management might have put the kibosh on anything actually interesting. Can they? I wonder about why that. not. I have no idea. I, if if I'm the NHL and if I'm MLS, MLSE, I write in there that I get decisions on final cut. Well, I mean, I want to see Kyle Dubas. You know, I, my patience is running thin, like the the thin thread on my cardigan. Like I want to, I want to see him actually get mad. And I wonder, can they? Do they have that ability? Because I feel like if you're going to do a documentary like this, you have to get that unfiltered. You have to have the Randy Toaster moments and you got to have the angry moments and the good moments. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I, I'm, if I am the broadcasting side of this, if I'm Amazon Prime, I say, okay, then we just won't. Yeah. And we, ha we have the money to nuke this. How many episodes is this going to be? Six or seven, right? Six. We might, I think we go six episodes and we don't hear an interesting word from Mitch Marner or Austin Matthews. Really? What are they going to say? I don't what are they going to no, no. allow? Matthew's parents in are in talk? it. Matthew's okay. parents are in the trailer. So sure. he'll he'll be talking. Mm -hmm. Tavares right. had a lot of FaceTime. He'll be talking. Sure. He'll be facing. Talking about Kale. <laughs> Mitch is interesting. I don't know. I think uh, they'll have Mitch in there. Here's yeah, the really he'll part. be in there, but will he be interesting? I think, obviously, they want their stars portrayed in the best light possible. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see two, two Matthews and Marners. Uh, Nylander doesn't say much, so I, I don't expect him to be in it much, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, you know, I think you're going to see happy Mitch and happy Austin, because let's be honest, during the regular season, the two of them just kicked ass. They were amazing. Um, and they're going to be glowing and fun, and you're going you're gonna to feel that, fuck, I love these guys a little bit. And then the playoffs are going to hit and you're going to hear that. I think anyway, if they were able to do this, you're going to hear that postseason interview um, where they're absolutely the most disappointed you've ever seen in your life. Because you know that's coming. This is the funny thing. It's like um, it's a little like a Tarantino movie. You know the ending. <laughs> it's you're, you're working backwards from the ending. And it, it's, it, it's the most interesting part of any story is not the ending. It's how you got there. The, the trailer... The trailer had what the title should be. Yeah, we lost again. That's why I think you're actually going to see a lot more. That's why I have a lot of faith in what this is going to be. Because, you know, a lot of people be like, oh, they'll never allow that. They acknowledge it right off the top in the trailer. You and if they no weren't choice. going to allow that. No, no, you did. You did have a choice. You could just say it's all or nothing. Leafs, promo, promo, promo. You yeah, have absolutely. They're going to acknowledge that they lost. But are the individual characters that we want to hear from going to be very interesting? Are we going to come so. away from this being like, yo, Mitch Marner? Like, I didn't know that guy. And now I know him. I don't think we are. You don't think so? No, I we'll do. See. I, I feel like we're going to see a little bit more of a three dimensional look at these guys' personalities. I think you're going to be mad upset about losing two guys, Zach Hyman and Zach Bogosian. Um, uh, I think Zach Bogosian's the character guy that you're going to be like, man, I really love this guy. And you saw him on FaceTime with his family. You know, one of the reasons he wouldn't sign in Toronto again is because of the way our government handled the pandemic. And well, he and wants he didn't want to be in lockdown and he couldn't see his family. It was hard, you know, for those guys like, you know, we can criticize him and everything. But like to be away from your family is brutal. I don't think there's anything to criticize Bogosian for. Right. I mean, he came in, he played great, got his three year contract in Tampa and wants to be with his family who play who can blame him. And yeah. and, and then, of course, with, um, you know, with with Hyman money. But you're going to be mad about losing Zach Hyman because he's a great person. And I think you're going to hear from him a lot. You're going to be mad about losing Zach Bogosian because what great value and everybody probably loved him. And I think what is going to be interesting for me, and I think what Leaf fans have been desiring, and I almost wonder in seeing this trailer if, we've, if this is why we haven't seen it yet. What I think Leaf fans want more than anything is an acknowledgement from the star players about what happened in the playoffs. Not excuses. Not maybe it could have gone differently. We weren't good enough. We weren't there. It didn't happen. And there's no fucking excuse. If I heard that from Matthews and Marner, I'd be super fine. Like I'd be, I'd be like, okay, 
well, you have the talent, so you might as well try, you know, try again next year. I wonder if we're going to see that, if we're going to see an acknowledgement that, guys, we disappeared. Our line disappeared. I want to see, I want to see what Sheldon Keefe said after the first intermission of game five. The Habs come out and steamroll them after getting dominated for like three straight games. And I just, I just want like a good old fashioned, like, is, is it, what the fuck was that? Or is it Sheldon when he first joined the Leafs where pathetically they had like a three, nothing lead. Then it's three, two or even three, one. And he's calling timeouts to be like, calm down, everybody. Everything's okay. He came in and he had to be positive guy. Remember the beginning of Sheldon? Remember the, the, those COVID t- Sheldon. The Leafs are like yeah. up two goals and he's taking timeouts. That's how fragile this team is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we thought they were past that. I, I think the story of the season, you don't even try to create one. You focus on moments. Because there were some really cool moments, interesting moments, moments involving conflict. Um and like perseverance and then make the team look good. Your first game against Montreal, you're down three, one, please, please someone punch me in the face as hard as you can. And then you come back and win that game. And uh, the Simmons fight with Ben Sherratt when they're down three, one. So you can go long with the first game. I want to see that. I want to see the reaction to Campbell getting hurt in that first game against Calgary. I want to see, the aftermath of Muzzin flipping the puck at Matthew Kachuk, which I think was a different game mm-hmm. against Calgary. I want to see them blowing the 5-1 lead to the Sens. And again, all their massive collapses, I want locker room access. I want to know what the hell was said. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know the look on their face. I want to know what the reaction was when Edler hit Hyman. Mm. I want that. Um, You're asking you- a lot from this doc. No, I'm, I'm, this is how I would attack it. If I was creating it, I'd be like, okay, what were the most compelling moments of the regular season? And then for the playoffs, I, I, I have no idea what you do, but I I tell you, this is what I would want. If I was the Leafs, I don't, if I was the production team, I probably wouldn't want this, but if I was the (laughs) Leafs, what I would want is the final episode has nothing to do with last season. It's just previewing this upcoming season. Here's Nick Ritchie. Here's Peter Morazic. <laughs> Andre Kasha. Here's Andre Kasha. No, I'm, de- I'm dead serious. Are they still filming? I'm dead. S- no. Uh, you, no, you, that's, it's what I would do. It's what I would do. You can't be, <laughs> you can't be camera locked. This is, this is what I would do. Or at very least, the end of the second last episode is like heading into game six or sorry, I wish. heading into game seven or something. Then they blow it. And then the most of the episode is about this upcoming year which is about to happen in like a week. or. Whatever. I wish you executive produced the series. I would watch that. I think you would do the, you would do a better job than the executive producer on this series. We don't know I that yet. I have no Let's idea. Watch no. It. Let's I'm watch willing it. to bet no. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. know I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm literally guessing because we haven't seen it yet, but that sounds great. Yeah. like I'm It sounds to, like you I'm would do a great job. Of, I'm trying to think of like the big fights or like the big... Here's my, like, like my problem the, with that, Steve, is that I don't what? know that anybody's going to take that seriously. If you were going to have, if you spend a good chunk of that last episode going, well, how about this season? Then every Leaf fan's going to go, fuck you. No, you <laughs> need, nobody's in the mood to hear that. Nobody. Nobody is in the mood to hear that. It needs to be structured like a horror movie. Like, you know what, hey, everyone, we're having a fun time and a fun trip. And then the first creepy guy shows up like standing in the courtyard, I'm I'm picturing us, the the Jordan Peele thing. The, yeah. Do, 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 do. Like I'm I'm picturing that, and and you know Austin and Mitch and Willie see just a different version of themselves, but wearing the old shitty Leaf logo, and they're like, "Who are they?" Like in the in the driveway. It's because, what it needs to do. The first few episodes need to do is it needs to remind you how good the team was. It needs to remind you oh. how much. How much you believed in them, how much you thought this year was different. I sure as hell did. And how that was warranted. And how it was warranted. And it needs to, I need to, I, it's got to be agony. I'm sorry. I, I'm, this is, this is yes. about the Leafs and designed for Leafs fans. 
I ha- I'm going to feel shitty. So you're going to go into the, how much stuff you watch? How much co- uh, media do you consume or you feel shitty? You're going to feel shitty. Probably. Like, it'll be it. like, this is us. If it was terrible. Yeah. Like, like if, if there was it, one sad moment rather than one, every episode, it, it needs to, it needs to remind you and it needs to set up the Leafs being up three, one with an air of, even though, you know, they lost, you're like, there's no way they're going to lose. Yes. Cause yes. there was people were texting me after they lost game five and they're like, are you nervous? And truthfully and earnestly, I'm like, no, no, I'm not. That was, that was a one-off game. It was a Habs best game of the series and they still blew a three, a three, nothing lead and nearly lost. It was a stupid mistake that cost them. I was nervous. Uh, I mean, deep down. Yeah, probably, (laughs) probably I was, but it, it, the, the, the mission of every episode leading up to them getting eliminated is to make you forget that they lost. Mm-hmm. And then they got to clobber you with they lost. It needs to be heart wrenching. It's, it's got to be awful. And then I don't, I don't think it makes any sense to end it, uh, to end this show about last season with last season. You have to end it with this one. Mm-hmm. You have to. You got to show me the new faces. Mm-hmm. You got to show me the guys who have no idea what they're in for. You, you gotta. You gotta show me. I want. I want. I want a funny interview with Peter Morazic. Like, hey, you have. You, you have some history in that building, eh? There, Peter. Like, remember you the role you played in the whole David Ayers game, and you know maybe sh- did Kasha ever score at the uh, at Scotia Bank? Did Nick Ritchie? I mean, talk to him about the Bruins. Drive the knife in. Show me Nick Ritchie and the Bruins eliminating uh, the Leafs in 2019. Just drive it in. Was he on that team? I don't know. Um, It has to, it has to, has to, has to set up this season. You can't just end it with how shitty last season ended. And, oh, you know, but we're stronger now. Like, that. that, the the one thing in that trailer where I was like, "Uh uh-oh, don't go down that road, is growing as a team. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no yeah, one's don't interested. tell me that. Don't I don't care. Do not care. Yeah, no, I don't. And, uh, they were gr- they've been growing as a team for half a decade. Don't, don't give me that shit. I want to. It, 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 they lost. It sucks. Here's this year. The perfect ending for me will be: Are we growing? Can we do this? We got one more shot. Like that will be the perfect ending because that's the reality. The reality is everybody's gone. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be no- major, major, major changes. Forget about, uh, you know, I mean, you're going to have mega players gone and you're going to have management gone. Oh, I want this year. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it was this year's when they started. I wish they started filming after at like three one and then it ends next playoffs. Because this is truly the all or nothing year. Yeah. This is all or nothing. Not last year. Well, and maybe they'll continue. Like if the Leafs are smart, don't let it end here. Right. Just like season two. Play on the, yeah, do season two. Just keep going. Because honestly, if they end here, and even if the Leafs won the cup next year, it's a pretty unsatisfying way to end, just like the season was. And it's hard for anyone to get up and get pumped about, I don't even know if we're going to be able to do it. Our team is objectively worse next year. Because they are. They are. You keep, you keep saying that like it matters. <laughs> you keep saying that like it matters it's hockey it doesn't matter that they're no. on paper you keep saying that like it matters it's what, why doesn't it matter tell me i know what you're i think i know where you're going but still explain the, the regulars the, the, so the nhl is one of the only uh leagues where it's um you win a championship by playing two different sports so uh the regular season they play regular season hockey and that's cute and it's fun and then the playoffs come around And it's this entirely different sport with different officiating and different feel and different intensity and everything. Other sports have different intensity. This has an entirely different rule book. And the Leafs were, this isn't an excuse. It's not incoming. Don't don't yell at me. Yeah, I hear you. I I hear you yelling at me. Um, It needs to, I need to be left going. What the fuck? Like that's, that's the feeling we all had. And there it's either, they need to lean into the what the fuck, or it has to be the fuck. Ex- what's, explain it. You know what I mean? Sorry, I'm talking about two different things. You, you asked me to explain what I mean. Uh, the Leafs could be better next year and have a better group because they'll be better 
equipped for the playoffs. And we're going to have absolutely no indication of that until the playoffs begin. Sure. We're going to have no indication. You're going to see them. You're going to see them bang and crash one night and they're going to out hit some teams 62 to 17 and they're going to win five, one, and they're going to get in five fights and they're going to have uppercut knockouts like video game style and all of them. Mike Tyson's punch out. (laughs) Oh yes. Yeah. Little Mac just getting in there and you're, and you're going to be knocking out, uh, who is it? King Hippo and uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sandman and all those other ones from video games that are long gone in the past. Glass Joe, going to knock yeah. out Glass Joe. Last Joe. Yeah. You're going to knock out Piston Honda and you're going to be like video games used to be pretty racist. And then, you know, all those things. So, and, but it's not going to matter. It's, you're going to be like, that's a playoff style win. And it's a lie. It's playoff style. Sure. It's like a Louisiana style sandwich in Oshawa. It's Louisiana style, but you got to go to Louisiana for the real thing. Ah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. In the playoffs in this particular comparable, the playoffs are Louisiana. Okay. <laughs> and the Leafs don't do so well in Louisiana. Well, so I, I am curious about the note that they ended on. And, 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 and that's, that is going to be the thing because you got to have when you're doing a documentary series like this, you got to have a reason for people to watch to the end. The reason I will watch to the end is I want to know the mentality of the team at the end of this documentary. I want to know how they see themselves and I want to know how the documentary illustrates it. I'm really interested in how they do that because here's the thing. The, you guys talk about what the lease will allow. The production company and Amazon Prime themselves would all pride themselves on doing documentaries that are accurate, not documentaries that are what the subject wants, because that's just promotion. Right. And, and, and Amazon doesn't, Amazon doesn't need to spend money on a documentary. That's just promotion for a major league sports team. They don't need to do that. So you got to keep that in mind, right? Like, you know, the, all the Leafs are worth a billion dollars. Amazon's worth like a trillion. Like it's, it's, they're just, it's not even in the same ballpark. So, for Amazon to agree to do this, for the production company to, to agree to do this um, and have the Amazon funding behind it, I really think that they're going to make this as, as accurate as possible. That's what I'm holding out hope for. And I am very, very curious to see what this does. And the, the, the only thing that is really going to suck as a Leaf fan. Is it them losing? You, well, I think you have to accept this as Leaf fans is the fact that we'll be the butt of everybody's joke again this season like every time the Leafs fuck up there's going to be quotes in there that people are going to take and they're going to use on Twitter and like there will be infamous Randy Carlisle Phil Kessel and the toaster moment uh there will be many 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 of those and I just hope everybody's ready for it because yet again here we are cheering for the most hated team and boy are they easy to make fun of for everyone on Leafs Twitter who's on Twitter all the time what if you didn't (laughs) What if you just sort of stop that for a while? This is not good for you. Mm-hmm. It's horrible. Oh, you don't want to be the butt of the jokes? Stay off where everyone makes the jokes. You cheer for the, I don't know, deluxe Buffalo Sabres? Like, it's it's really... Buffalo it's, Sabres with money? <laughs> yeah. And, like, deluxe for now. Like, we yeah. might switch. Might have to switch entire teams. Peter Pocklington, you know, back in the day styles. Uh, but the, where it ends off, Adam, I think you're going to get half of what you want. Okay. What do you think? It's going to be, it's not going to be the stars. It's going to be the decision makers. Okay. So Dubis is more than happy enough and more than willing to be the dartboard. It's going to be a lot of him going, what the fuck? It's going to be a lot of Keith going, what the fuck? Shanahan. You know, he might come in with a, you know, a more subtle kind of wandering the room back and forth, you know, what, mumble, what the fuck? Like, it, like it's going to be, it's going to be different degrees of what the fuck, but you're not going to, it won't be, I don't think you're going to see any of the big guys. No. And I, th- I think it's. At a certain point, it would be know. really nice if this Toronto Maple Leafs team, as much as we've, you know, you sometimes laugh at, at the, the amount of. Uh, amount of reverence given to Mark Messier, it would be really nice to have a leader like that who just said, fuck it, it's our fault. 
Now right. we'll exclude the Vancouver years from that. But well, yes, you know what, yes. But but I, you know what I mean. Like I, it would be really great to have a leader strong enough to do that. And what's the best predictor of uh, future results? It's your past. Uh, it's your past. So what have yeah. we seen from this team? Not that. Let's run and hide. So I'm not going to, I don't anticipate those things. I will be pleasantly surprised if it happens. I mean, if I was one of those stars, I would, I would want to be in this as much as possible. Oh yeah. It's, it's an opportunity to tell your story. Everyone's just been shitting on you for months <laughs> after you played the best season of your lives. And then you played like three bad games. Seriously. Mm-hmm. And you know, you now your entire reputation is is based on like, screw the rocket, screw finishing top five in NHL scoring. It's three bad games. That like, is professional sports, though. Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying woe is them, but I don't know. You have an opportunity to do some extracurricular work here. Get in, get into it, lean into it. That's what we're hoping. Well, we'll see that. Uh, we'll see what happens with this. Um, I am. I am. I'm gonna watch everything. I'm all the way oh, in. Yeah. And uh, oh, and nothing. Excited, you know what I'm excited about is it gives us content to talk about. I'm not sure if they're releasing it on a week by week basis or if it's just a full, total binge. I hope it's all at once. I hope it's not. So that way we don't have to hit it all in the same episode. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know I agree. I, mean? I hope it's weekly just so somebody doesn't watch it all in eight hours and then it's all over Twitter. They've clipped it all and it's ruined yeah. for you. Wasn't, yeah. wasn't The Last Dance two episodes a week? Oh, God. You're asking me to remember the beginning yes. of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. They did it. I think it was four weeks and it was two episodes. They did like hour. They did an hour of the show and it was two half an hour episodes. Okay. Well, because they can't. The one, one thing I said in the car, like I literally got in from Ottawa and sat down in this chair, is I don't want to be watching a documentary about last season, this season. Mm-hmm. Mm. I want it to be done when this season begins. Exhibition, fine. Who cares about exhibition? But. Yeah. Once the games that count start, I want I would like this to be done. <laughs> Just want to take a break to tell you this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash SDP. Now, life is full of stressors. It doesn't matter who you are, what you have. Life is stressful. And you're going to have things in your life that are going to throw you off. Maybe feeling down. Maybe feeling out. Maybe a little depressed. Maybe that you're like at a total loss. And if your stress is high, your temper is shorter than usual, Uh, Even if you're starting to feel kind of the strain of relationships, you probably need a chance to unload to a third party. Well, unload that stress, get it out. Talk to somebody who's completely unbiased about your life. Somebody who isn't going to judge you or take sides on anything. And when there are things you can't tell anyone, this is a person that you can tell. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't feel comfortable. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get unbiased feedback that you'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and the code is SDP. Listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash SDP. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash SDP. With summer in full swing, we're swapping out the winter warp for easy, breezy, comfort, for the season with award-winning sheets from Brooklinen. You should check it out. It's one of the coolest things about Brooklinen is you've got so many options. They're famous for their luxe sateen and classic percal sheets, but also they've got some amazing linen and some even more amazing cashmere sheets because you should treat yourself. And when it comes to prints and colors, they whip up new styles every season, like the ochre colorway in linen and banana stripe pattern in classic and luxe. Those are my personal favorites, just in time for summer. Brooklinen sheets also pair perfectly with the rest of their bedding essentials like cozy comforters, pillows, and duvet covers. And since everyone knows summer comfort goes way beyond the bedroom, they've also got some seriously great bath towels, robes, and beach towels too. All this high quality, luxury grade comfort without the luxury price tags. It's no wonder why Brooklinen's got over 75,000 five-star reviews and counting, hopefully yours to be included. So get ready for summer. Go to brooklinen.com and use the promo code SDP to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com slash SDP for $20 off a minimum purchase of $100. That's brooklinen.com slash SDP. So with the world opening back up again, have you considered 
what you'll feel like when you slide your suit on for the first time. I know that I'm looking at my closet with a little bit of anxiety. Bodies change over the course of a couple of years. And frankly, I'm not a guy that wears suits very often. And that's why it's important that they fit me properly. So when I do wear them, I feel and look sharp. And secondly, the price is affordable. And that's why you should check out Indochino. Indochino offers completely custom fitted suits, shirts, casual wear, and more surprisingly, affordable rates. How about that? Every piece is made to your exact measurements and you can customize every single detail in these suits. Choose everything about your suit from the fabric, the lapel, the monogram, the statement, the linings. You can create the suit that fits you and your style perfectly. And the best part, an Inoshino suit starts at $399 with all customizations included. Indochino is now open at select Nordstrom stores. So it gives you a little bit more of a chance to get in there and get your personalized custom suit done. You can find the nearest location at Indochino.com. And right now you can get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more using the code SDP. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at Indochino.com. Promo code SDP. Look good. You deserve it with Indochino. Um, now let's move on to another, uh, quiet fuck by, uh, Brendan Shanahan and the organization quiet. Oh, fuck moment. Oh, okay. I understand now. I yeah. understand. The Sorry. Words. I could have, I could have worded that better, but that's what this is. You know, you could have, you could have, um, <laughs> so does milkshake e duck experience. <laughs> what do you like, mean? Well, like I was on, well, f first of all, for everyone who doesn't understand the meme, there was a tweet that was basically like, you know, a newscaster going, everyone look at the milkshake duck. Everyone loves this duck who drinks milkshakes. And then two weeks later, we regret to inform you the milkshake duck is racist. <laughs> yes. Like kind of like the Ken, Ken something, the, the guy that Ken like, Bone. Ken Bone. That's right. And they found out that he had said some really terrible shit on Reddit. And, and oh, like, I don't remember that. everybody was in love with Ken Bone for a bit. And then they're like, oh, they found his Reddit account and he said Ew. some terrible shit. Um, I was like at lunch, saw they hired Dusty Emo, and I was like, I know that person. I've heard of that name. Uh, cool, good, great. And then I like finished the meal, paid for it, and got back to the so, hotel. And we regret to inform you. <laughs> now I, I have to, I have to specify this. Uh, and Steve, I know you wanted to jump right into the story, sorry, but I have sorry, to, sorry. I have to headline the story. Dusty Emo was hired by the Toronto Marlies to be the goaltending coach. And this is a guy that was at, uh, he was in LA for a while. Um, he's a BC native. He was playing, he was coaching for Kunlun Red Star as well. Yep. Um, and is a well-renowned goalie coach. Like great friends with Jack Campbell. Yeah. That's where you worked with him with the Kings. Um, however, um, it, it came out not minutes later that Dusty Emo had a personal Twitter account and people went through his likes as one does. And what you, what you saw were, were transphobic, anti-black, pro-Trump, and anti-vaxxer sentiments. And oh, Adam, you can't, why can't you just have political opinions? You know what I mean, guys? <laughs> like, High five, guys. Like, like, here's what? the thing. What's the matter? If you're pro-Trump, the Leafs would still hire you. But if you're anti-black and transphobic, like even if you're anti-vaxxer, the Leafs might still hire you. But he went transphobic ham. and anti-black. Yeah, he you, nailed them all. He, like, he went ham on January 6th as well. Like just uh, yeah, he supported the Capitol. Like just. Just loved it. Just, just ate it up. And <laughs> like, he was like, mm, this is a sandwich. I'm going to, I'm going to eat the Capitol riot. It's delicious. We're doing they the right thing here. should be embarrassed that they didn't do their due diligence. Well, and so let me read the statement from Brendan okay, Shanahan because ahead. a couple of days later, it took 48 hours and I'm going to, I have a theory as to why, but we'll get to that in a second. Sure. It said, Dust Emo will not be joining uh, the Toronto Maple, or sorry, the Toronto Marlies. Uh, we made a mistake by not thoroughly following our organiza organizational protocols when considering this candidate for the position of goaltending coach for the Toronto Marlies. So they make this announcement, the Twitter stuff comes out, and management needs, like they make it in the afternoon, right? And that's a couple of days ago. So then they have to look at the the, the fallout. The social media person for the Marlies is like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> you do feel bad for the person oh. who had to issue the tweet and then compile the responses and run it up the chain to management. Like, it's because they're going to run it up the chain to the Leafs assistant general manager, who is the manager of the Toronto Marlies. And then, and then they're going to, and then that has to get to Kyle Dubas and Kyle Dubas has to transfer that to Brandon Shanahan. And then it's, what do we do? And then it's, 
okay, well, we can't have this guy in here, but he's already signed a contract. So we got to pay him out to get rid of him. And that's probably what happened, by the way. He signed oh. a contract. The Leafs probably had to go through a bunch of legal loopholes to say, how do we not have him now? And I would not be surprised if, he, if this guy signed a one or two or three year deal, coaches, when they get fired under contract, get paid anyway. Right. So Mike Babcock still being paid by the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so I would not be, I would not shock me if Dusty Emo is being paid by the Leafs for whatever length of term he agreed to work with them. I'd love to know the answer to that question. That's fascinating. Me too. I'd love to know who made the final decision to bring him in and to also let him go. Well, it had to be Shanty. Well, because I was uh, Ryan Hardy. The Toronto Maple Leafs announced today that Ryan Hardy is joining the organization as senior director of minor league operations in his role. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Hardy named general manager. This is AHL.com. So it was Lawrence Gilman, I think, Mm -hmm. most recently. I think he's still with the organization. Um, Oh, here it is. Lawrence Gilman, who has served as GM of the Marlies since 2018, will be elevated to the role of senior vice president of the Marlies while maintaining his roles as assistant GM of uh, the Maple Leafs and governor of the AHL club. So I don't know whose final decision it was, but like that is, that is like, I, I, how many people listening to the show locked their Twitter account before a job interview? Right. Like I've, I've heard, and by the way, I'm not saying, oh man, he should have done that. <laughs> I mean, the better thing to do would be to not believe those terrible things. But like the reason they tell you to lock is because companies look mm-hmm. and it's, it's just the most basic oversight. That's why, that's why I think they should be really embarrassed by whatever HR person or recruiter, whoever's job that is. You're a billion dollar company. You have enough staff where you should be paying somebody to go through your recent hires and vet them and see if they're a good hire for your company. And no one did this. And random Twitter users had to be the one to go and do this and figure out who Dusty is as a person. So my question on that is, how do we know? How do we know what? How do we know they didn't know? Oh, nowhere in Brendan oh, wow. Shanahan's statement say hmm. said where nowhere in that statement did it say we didn't know. Hmm. And you know that there are varying views in any organization of uh, uh, of of people who you know have different people call that political. I don't call those, those some of those issues no. political. They're they weren't not political. like. Anti-black is not a political issue. Being racist isn't a political issue. It means you're racist. Being transphobic is not a political issue. Uh, Vaccinations, believe it or not, not a political issue. That's science. Yeah. So so, so (laughs) my question, I know you're frustrated, but guys. You ever feel like we've had this conversation 500 times? Nowhere in that statement did the Leafs say we didn't know. And I, that's the part that freaks me out. You know, if you, if you, if you, I, I have no problem with people like it's like, well, you, you know, what do you expect them to never hire a conservative? That is not conservatism. That's very different. And I have no issues with conservatives being hired and left leaning people and oh. centrists being hired. My issue is anti-vax, anti-black, anti uh, or transphobic, if you want to say it. I have an issue with that. And my concern is that you think this organization doesn't know that? You think that they didn't look into that? <laughs> That's because here's the thing. Neither answer is good. Neither no. answer is good yeah. because, because either way, it makes you look terrible, especially with the involvement that the Leafs have in the community. Obviously, the, the, there was the Morgan Riley situation a few years ago, and Dubas was out with Riley at the Pride Parade saying, listen, this was not what he said, and this is, but we're still going to support the community. And I have no doubt that that was earnest. Oh, man, I forgot about that one. But, I, but we have to recognize here that... That statement was very short. We didn't follow protocols. What are the protocols? I think and the they'll never tell us. We didn't check his goddamn Twitter. Now, I don't think that's, I think, I think that somebody let that through. And I don't <laughs> think that's what the Leafs stand for. I don't think it's what the Leafs want to stand for. I can tell you the owners of the Leafs, Rogers, Bell, Larry Tannenbaum, are not fucking happy. They are not no. happy about this. Because they're, remember, two major telecoms and a major leader in the business community. Are you kidding me? They have no interest in being associated with a person like this. None. However, 
somebody in the organization absolutely knew and either chose to say nothing or said, you know what? People have different views. And there are people that are like that. That's a and, fascinating and theory. I think, mm. I think you have to consider that. Yeah. I think you have to consider that. How is it possible? You're, I, it's just, to me, it doesn't seem probable that an organization doesn't go through your Twitter account. And if, and if they didn't, holy shit, that looks terrible too. I think the answer is often the most mundane. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, my, like, I have a one word answer, August. Uh, August is, is uh, tumbleweed month in hockey. True. And I think they made a decision and I think there was an oversight and it just sort of happened. And now they got to clean up a mess. And do you, all these dudes are at their cottage. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. They, they, you know how fucking, do you know how furious everyone involved must have been? They must have been pissed. Somebody's oh my been- God. None of them. I can almost guarantee none of them are at home. The only reason they might be is because of COVID restrictions. Mm. But like these are, these are all very well to do. There's people. no COVID restrictions for, for rich people. Let's also make that. <laughs> yeah, clear. no, there haven't so, been since 2020. Like yeah, there they're not, been they're not at home. <laughs> they're they're <laughs> at a cabin somewhere. You're, you might even be, or you, you're on a boat. You're enjoying time with your family after maybe the most difficult season of your career. And you're having marshmallows by the fire. And you literally, <laughs> someone texts you a tweet from an account called Hockey Nuisance. <laughs> is that what it is? Is oh, Hockey Nuisance? Yes. Is that his name? It was a few accounts. No, 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 no. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Ho- Hockey Nuisance had the screen, the screen grabs. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm just, I'm just imagining. I would love to know the shade shanahan turned Uh, like i wish oh yeah i wish he's not gonna be okay with this oh god i wish so bad i wish so bad we could have taken it before and after like just yeah i'm i adam i'm 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 with you it could be all that but uh when it comes to hockey august is a tumbleweed month i think the answer is is very mundane they just fucked up well sure but who fucked up and why who made that call it's the and, new guy to the organization, most likely. And Wouldn't what? You say? It's well, it, yes. And he I, probably needed another meeting to say, "Hey, uh, this is what the Leafs stand for. This is what the Leafs stand for." I'm not sure how serious you took this in the past. This is what the Leafs stand for. Right. Well, and he's. It's also interesting that the Leafs are marching to the beat of their own drum, where because they could have just mm-hmm. um, handed Oops, him. We'll a try mil- to rehab. Yeah, they could have handed him a million dollars oh. and then done an interview where he's like, actually, I never supported the insurrection and then had him play defense. They yeah. could have done that. That would have been uh, rough. For he's, a young, it would have been, he's a would young 51-year-old man who made a bad choice. He's just a, uh, hey, listen, listen. There's, I mean, we all know who exactly who I'm talking about. And no, the don't. Hurricanes just sort of wrote it out and turned it into a PR win and didn't give a shit. Dude was on parlor. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? And he's going to play right D for them next year. I wasn't even talking about this him. guy's fired. I wasn't talking about him. I was talking I was. about the Montreal Canadians. Oh, uh, great. I take your pick. Young um, man who made a decision. I, I oh, now, to, to every social media person in the NHL. Good luck. Not personal. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. It isn't personal though. Thank God. I feel so bad for the, the ones who got to manage that brand because they don't make a choice in that. The, hur- the Hurricanes Twitter person, I was just like, oh, you don't deserve this personally, mm-hmm. but uh, you're going to have a there, rough little while. Okay. The Hurricanes oh. Twitter person is fucking amazing. It's just a shame that they have to put up with this. Imagine being the Blackhawks Twitter person right now. Oh, they're, oh. they're, they're scratching. They're, they're putting like little ticks in the wall, counting down the days till that contract expires. Like, just, <laughs> it's, so- they, they can't wait. They can't wait till that contract's done. I love Mike Stevens. We love our boy, Mike Stevens. Uh, Which Staff one? Specify there's 19. It's our boy, Mikey, who, who basically is uh, Mikey, who I actually, I, I, I was going to have beer with tomorrow, but I had to cancel. Um, oh, boo, bad I know. friend. Boo, I know, bad shit. friend. Boo, I know. We're going to see each shit. other at the end of the month, though. I love Mikey. But he boo. tweeted this. He and won't I think be there either. It was important. He said, it's important to remember that Dusty Emo did this to himself. If he didn't have a Twitter account, he would be employed by the Marlies right now. But- he had to go around liking heinous shit and publicly outing himself as a bigot. 
This isn't, quote, cancel culture. This is consequences. It's not even if he had a Twitter account. It's like if he just made it private on Sunday. Yeah. You know, like, well, oh, what a bad move. <laughs> what, what, wait, what a bad before, move. Who had you? screen caps of Dusty Emo's Twitter likes prior to that announcement? <laughs> Someone. I also want to say, if you're him, if you're him, do you need to like the tweets? Right. Like, like, I mean, like these racists are really bad at being that. Like it's, you don't want to come out and be like, I'm a super racist dude. It's like, it's, it's crazy. And when I say what a bad move, I mean by the organization as a whole for yeah, we, having that as an oversight. No, you weren't saying you like, know? Hey, Dusty, be, be better at racism. <laughs> be sneakier time. at your racism, well, you know? No, the also, Leafs need to be better at identifying the people they're hiring and recognizing that, hey, all of this stuff is public. I did, I did speak to someone who has known him for a long time. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I never had any inkling of any of this. And I think there's a lot of stories like that. I think there's a lot of stories like that that have cropped up, especially over the last five, six years. Um, that it, The past five, six years have, have rotted and potentially permanently ruin some brains um at least in some respect i know, like even in my family there are people who have known each other for over half a century they'll never speak to each other again mm-hmm. and i th- i think there's a lot of people in the same boat there's a lot of people in the same boat and it came out of, they never knew it came out of nowhere um and it just is what it is i'm fascinated and- to see what the next move is here and in all of those arguments, the transphobic racists are on the wrong side. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. But the I other think you're right. Let's We've all had that, thank you. That, yeah. that thing with our, you know, uh, or maybe not all of us, but some of us. Um, as Steve said, there are members of my family where you go, okay, all right. And- I'm, not, I'm not even talking about the argument, Jesse. I'm talking about the, I had no idea you even thought that way. Mm-hmm. Or, Based on our past conversations, you don't think that way. Where, where did this change from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And remember, I, do you guys remember we were in this very room? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was us three and a friend of ours. And he was, he was like, oh, well, you know, the media just lies about everything. <laughs> and we, all three of us <laughs> at the no, same I, time looked at each other and then looked at him and we're like, dude. What? We're in the media. We are <laughs> like, in the media. <laughs> I mean, well, not all of them then. Like, so, but he read that enough times that he believed it without even thinking about, oh, some of my best friends are in the. I had to. Okay. Friends with that person. Jesse, do you want to hear a funny story? What? Okay. So back in the day, this was probably 2011. Okay. Uh, I was reading some tweets in Calgary, sitting on my couch, which was a futon and reading some tweets and doing some things and. Uh-oh. I see Steve underscore Dangle come up. I think I know where you're going. Do you remember this? I and I, I don't even remember what it was about. But he said, the hockey media will tell you dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And I had to tweet at him and I'm say, hey, man, you're in the hockey media. Sean Are you aware of that? <laughs> Sean, Sean Fitzgerald did as well. Bless him. Really? Yeah. He, he did. Well, because I probably did it more than once. Right. Because I was an outsider, man. You're in the, you're the nation's network, bro. Yeah, they don't get it <laughs> only i get it with my shitty youtube channel and camera that has me in a weird shade of red because i don't know how to fix it and it's old why me my opinion matters and they they just don't get it the media <laughs> also, like, listen i have had some very stupid opinions like you know some of them might have been on this episode. I'm not sure yet. Mm-hmm. Um, boy, have we traveled a journey. Yeah, we have. In this conversation. I, I, I just think that's no, a funny Steve story. You know, we were like 22. Like, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but a little bit different. I'm like, whoosh, pff, this guy thinks fighting affects the outcome of a game. What a moron <laughs> versus all the stuff that he was fired for. But it's, it is, uh, it's a, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening right now who know that person. Yep. They and know someone they've known their whole life. Here's, here's the hard part. Know. Love that person. Yeah. Love that person. Love that person. And how do you, how do you unlove someone? 
right? Tough. Like you, it's tough, but you, 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 you try and go, what, what happened here? What happened to here? And, and, and there's so many people in that position and there's so many people who are never going to get an answer. Yep. Yep. Uh... And at the end of all this pertaining to the hockey conversation, um, yeah, the Marley still need a goalie guy. So yep. there's a, an opening. Well, don't um, announce this one. You don't have to like, it's the, Mar- no one, I don't know, whatever. I also good to know that. You know what? Announce it. Screw it. For everybody out there with that conversation, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. So both opposite ends of the justice uh, in the United States, right? They were both Supreme Court judges, both on this. He was Supreme right. She was maybe a little bit left and uh, and also pro women's rights and abortion and things like that, which I guess are considered left issues. Um, They were good friends. And complete political and legal opposites. And, you know, it's funny, you know, that they were good friends. So it's a, it's a bizarre world that we're living in. Everything is, seems to be exasperated right now. At the end of the day, with the Leafs and with Dusty Emo, you can't, if the Leafs say they're going to be this thing, you can't have a guy like that as a part of your coaching staff. And, you know, you look at a guy like Jack Campbell, who loved this guy, from what we understand, um, like we said, with your family. Maybe they feel one way you feel the way the other, but you still love them. And, and I think what I saw a little bit of on Twitter that I think we need to caution ourselves against here is, well, Jack Campbell loved this guy. What does it say about him? I don't think it says oh. anything about Jack Campbell. Don't do that. Don't go there. It's not, that's not how this works. You love that your grandpa. A- your grandpa says some things. Like, yeah. That doesn't say anything about you. The fact it's that you blind, love your grandpa. Blind yeah. guess. Yeah. That is a, this is a blind, wild, outrageous guess. Don't. Yes, but I, I just want to caution people against doing that. Um, the Leafs made the right call here after making the wrong call. They corrected it. Good for them. Let's not go down this path again. If, you're hi- if, if, if the Leafs are hiring anyone, make sure you check their social media and we move on. Um, and they can find there are other goaltending coaches out there. Yeah. There are other people that, they, that can do this job and, and not be all of those things. The Leafs have said we are an inclusive environment. They have to keep to that. If they hadn't said that, maybe they don't care. So... Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, like, honestly, I mean, there's other teams that haven't made that pledge. Well, it was right. other teams that have and, and still don't care. You could have got D'Angelo for a million dollars if you didn't. Yeah. That. yeah, it was just interesting to see something happen. Because because that was that the theme of this offseason has just been, ah, just do it. Mm-hmm. Are they good? Ah, all right. Bring them in. <laughs> and, then, and then you take the, the Brad Pitt. From inglorious bastard stance of, nah, I'm going to get chewed out. I've been chewed out before. And you just ride it out. And he's still on the canes and he's still on the habs and it's fine. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. But no, they actually did something. So that brings us to another tough subject in Evander Kane. Evander Kane, who um, it is. Have, have Kevin, we not? We haven't touched this one, eh? Not really. So he has been he has been accused of because we had the Blackhawks episode last week, and we wanted to rightly wanted to focus right. on that. Right. Evander Kane was accused on social media by his now, I guess, soon to be ex wife separated uh, that he gambles on NHL games, and not only that, but games that he's playing in and against himself too. Against himself, yeah. So that he would now. That's, the idea that a single play, it, this is different, right? Pete Rose is the, is the, the guy that everybody talk, talks about when it comes to this. I don't know that Evander Kane is enough of an impact player to throw a game on his own. I really don't. Oh, buddy, get out of here. Yes, I don't he know. is. Yes, he absolutely is. He's one of the highest paid sharks. He makes $7 million bucks. He was He's probably their best forward or one of their best, maybe their best winger anyway. Oh, yeah, he can have an impact. On is the, the debate... Can a single hockey player throw a game for his entire team? Can I've they? been watching the Leafs my whole life. Yes, they can. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. They can do it not even trying to. Okay. I wanted to raise the question because I think it's you a legitimate question. You watch game five? Question. You watch if game you, six? You, here's the thing. You can't be one of these people who says, the, the, uh, the NHL is not like the NBA. Uh, it's a full team game. You need everybody on. And then in the same breath go, this guy, um, this guy can, uh, can throw a game on his own. You can't. So you're one side or you're the, the other on that. It's either the stars matter disproportionately or they don't. What about the over-under? What about the over-under? You, a player can affect the over-under. 
Sure. What, what, what I'm saying is, I I'm, think yeah. my point is, I think the stars really fucking matter in the NHL more than people give them credit for. That's oh. what I'm saying. That's okay. my that's my point. So if you're saying Evander Kane can uh, can affect the outcome of a game, then I'm saying then what I've been saying the entire fucking time is the stars have to show up for teams to win, which brings me back to the least. But anyway. I gotta. I really gotta let Adam talk because I was gearing up for an argument, and turns out you agreed the whole time. I did, but I have to bring that alternate view up because I think it's something that people say. But you cannot say the stars don't matter as much in the NHL, and then say guy can throw game on his own. You can't. What if both right. both could be probably? I think true. both can be true. Yeah, I, I think. Like there's no. I, well, I think you what just, you just—he's not the only guy that plays for them. Eric Carlson's there. Brent Burns is there. Uh, yeah. Mark Edward Vlasic is there. They had the shittiest goaltending in the history of man last yeah, year. Yeah, but I think but. I think it takes a team to win, and also, oh, a single guy could throw the game if he's trying to do it on purpose. I suppose. So <laughs> I think, I think both things are true, moment. Adam. I, I, I honestly, I don't see them. I see them as linked. <laughs> That's no, how I see them. You could have no. one bad shift and ah, oh, that was the difference. Yeah, but I, it's I also, also a team game. You would yeah. be able to understand. You, I think you'd be able to see a player doing that. And this is where it becomes really interesting yes. because um, when Evander Kane was traded to San Jose, they put on a full promo tour about how they were going to reform Evander Kane. Now, we didn't really know what the issues were with Evander Kane, except for a couple of things. Number one, him like randomly buying a billboard to say sorry to his girlfriend for something, which was on Sunset Boulevard. I don't know if you guys remember that TMZ story, but that oh, happened. Man. And then, of course, there was, you know, people, <laughs> people were on him about having like stacks of money in Vegas and like making a phone call with the stack of money, which, you know, I remember talking about that at the time. I'm like, well, the guy's a millionaire. Like, who cares? He can do what he wants. But the big issue was what happened with Dustin Bufflin and the Winnipeg Jets when Evander Kane was playing there. And if you remember, um, he showed up late. Uh, the word is that Dustin Bufflin threw his track suit. He threw up, he showed up late in a track suit. Dustin Bufflin threw his track suit in the shower and turned on the water. Uh, because a, you don't show up late B you're supposed to show up in a suit. That's, that's what they said. So, um, now when, uh, Evander Kane showed up in San Jose after the trade, um, one of the big stories I read at the time, and this was like a huge push. Uh, and I can remember this vividly because I thought this seems suspect to me. Joe Thornton showed up at the airport. Picked him. Adam, I have the article pulled up. Oh, please read it, Stephen. And just, just are we going to get to the uh, Kevin Kerr's article in The Athletic today? That's that what I'm at. Yeah, okay. that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to read one paragraph. It's from August 11th. Oh, never mind. This is the Kevin Kerr's article. So you want me to get okay. into it? Well, Sorry, I thought this too. was an old one. No, no, no. So, so the th this is the one. You, you, do, why, you do. This is why I'm bringing this up. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so I guess at the um, exit interviews, which they do every single uh, every single year in the NHL with every team, several key players informed Team Brass that if Evander Kane was going to be a part of the Sharks going forward, they didn't want to be. That's how bad it got. That is a direct quote from the article. Um, and the quote is, guys were going into Doug's office, as in Doug Wilson, all year long, according to one source, saying Kane had to go. All Doug would say is, all teams have locker room issues, which just isn't true. <laughs> uh, not the teams that win anyway. The Sharks ignored everything, and the team turned a blind eye. So obviously, I've talked to you about the accusation. And um, on previous Sharks teams, Kane had to answer to older, respected veterans like Pavelski, Ward, Martin, Joe Thornton, the latter of whom memorably picked up Kane at the airport after a midseason trade from Buffalo in February 26, 2018. All have since departed, including Thornton, who signed with the Leafs. Um, he's not having to answer to anyone, said one league source. Nobody in the room is a fan of him. Bugner likes him because he's a good player, because he genuinely is. But off the ice, it's just too much at this point. And like, it, he had a fantastic season numerically like i'm looking 56 games so he was healthy played the whole thing 22 goals 27 assists for 49 points so i would have put him on like a, a, a quick math like at least a 70 point pace or something like that mm -hmm. for a full season his penalties he only had 42 penalty minutes after 122 and 153 in the previous two seasons so those were way down so like a 70 point pace like a 30 goal pace this guy was great yeah. He was great last season, and the and his teammates were still like, "Nah, get him off. Nah, it's yeah. enough. 
I don't. Yep. Where did he rank? I just got to see. He led the team in scoring by a wide margin. He had 49 points. Logan Couture had 43. Only player to score uh, over 20 goals. Thomas Hurdle had 19. He had 22. Led the team in assists, for God's sake. He led them in everything. Mm-hmm. And they still were like, no, gone. Wow. Now, she's saying he's uh, – his ex-wife, by the way, has made this accusation along with saying that he's not supporting her or the couple's daughter while she's pregnant with their second child. And this is a, this is a major, obviously, personal issue. Uh, on Tuesday, Kane posted an image on his Twitter account of him wearing shark scare before pres- presumably going on the ice. Um, now, beyond all of this, we know and we've heard reports of that he is somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million in debt to multiple casinos. That's what we've heard. Or if it's not directly related to debt with the casinos, debt with third parties in order to finance betting at casinos. Um, And remember, his contract was worth $49 million. So what was going to happen here, what has happened is he borrowed against future earnings on his contract. I'm not sure if you know you can do this, but you can go to a third party lender, um, somebody who has a lot of money, And you could say to them, listen, I have a $49 million contract and that contract uh, goes over the next seven years. I would like access to that money now. A lot of, it's it's almost like if you have a house and you take out a line of credit against your house. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you know, under the right circumstances, it could be the right thing to do. It's always a risk. You always run a risk. But what some guys will do is they'll bet against their own contract. They'll borrow against their own contract and they'll invest the money in things like real estate. So what you can then do is, let's say you have a commercial building and you rent to McDonald's and you rent to a bank and you got a bunch of office space upstairs. You can take that money and start to pay off the loan and write off the interest. Now, I'm getting into the weeds with the business thing here, but the idea is to get away from um, to get more of that money up front. That's why NHL players are obsessed with the good ones anyway obsessed with getting their money as much up front as they can, because the longer that you have the money, the more years you have to build interest on that money. So when Tavares signed in Toronto, you know, those $10 million bonuses or whatever, that's a huge deal because you hand that to an investor, somebody that can work on your behalf, and you got $20 million in the first 12 months. That's a lot better than $20 million over say three years or something like that. And I'm just looking at his contract. It's actually kind of weird. So it's seven years. There's two years in the seven where he has no signing bonus for some reason. Okay. And this year is one of them. Oof. I don't know. I don't know if that's relevant, but uh, if you're in mm-hmm. debt, no signing bonus is tough. So this what's that? Not- just oh, let me go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So what the sharks and Kane were apparently looking at a couple of months ago, and I don't know where this story went, uh, was voiding the contract on both sides, because what he's doing is he's right now in debtor's court. And what that means is he can basically say, if he voids the contract, he can declare bankruptcy and it will absolve him of having to pay that off. And that's, that's a huge deal. So that means the Sharks on their end say, yep, we're, we're voiding the contract. Evander Kane says, yep, we're voiding the contract. He can declare bankruptcy uh, or insolvency, whatever you want to call it. And then I guess, and I don't, I'm not fully sure on the legality of how all this works. I don't think that lenders ever made whole. I don't know how that works. But basically, you're able to get out of um, paying that off, and he would have to. He would have terrible. He would have bad credit for the next five to seven years. Never be able to take out a loan. But when you can make millions of dollars, who cares? Um, it's one of those things that, at the end of the day, to get into this kind of trouble, um, there is at minimum a serious gambling addiction here. I mean, that's that's what we've been led to believe. If these are all gambling debts, if you can run up twenty million dollars in gambling debts. You got a problem. Now, on that issue, on that issue, I don't know what Evander Kane is like as a person. On that particular issue, the NHL has to treat this like they treat alcohol and drugs because you have to treat it like an addiction because that's what it is. If people could stop gambling, they would simply stop. If people could stop smoking, they would simply stop. And then, so I had, when I tweeted that, I tweeted that at the beginning of the summer, people were like, well, you could just, what if you just didn't? Well, if that was the case, he fucking can't, okay. right? That's the thing. He's got to want to seek treatment. Well, just stop drinking or just stop. Like, yeah. Well, oh, we, we, well then, yeah, you're right. You know what? Wow. How do we never think of that? Yeah. yeah. It's oh, crazy. Man. So, Thanks. 
on that particular issue, the NHL has to treat this like you treat uh, addiction to alcohol and drugs. Now, my question, and I don't have an answer to this, guys, is what happens when you find out that this guy's been betting on NHL games? Because I still believe that you, as the NHL, have to support him on addiction counseling. But if you can prove that he has gambled on games that the Sharks have been in and that he was playing in, is a ban for life really the right option? So I'm going to take a wild guess, but I think I'm right in that the language is definitely in the CBA that you can't bet on uh, yeah. on the NHL if you're a player a in the guess. NHL. So yeah, so I think there's a rule there that outlines that, hey, he's probably kicked out of the league in some regard. He's probably suspended for whatever the suspension is. It's probably a lifetime ban. But then I think as the NHL, there's also a human being here who seems like he's destroying his own life because of, of an addiction and the NHL PA in whatever form they take care of that for people with uh, drug abuse or alcohol addiction, they take care of that for Kane as well. So you help him on both fronts. You, you get, you take him out of the league if you did bet on the game and then you give him the treatment that would be afforded to a player with the same addiction in terms of alcohol or drugs. Now, let me ask you this. People are calling for a lifetime ban. At least they were when the story broke. You ban this guy for life. What reason, A, does the NHL have to support him? B, does he have to get better? You know, you could say, oh, he wants to get better for his family. Well, if that were the case, he probably would have been in gambling addiction before, right? He's deep into this, guys. And if you've never dealt with addiction up close, it's hard for you to understand, but I would suggest you do some research on it because it's far harder than you can even imagine. And what I would say to that is, if you don't give somebody motivation to get back the life and the career that they want, that they worked so hard for, as in, if you ban him for life, what is, it's the carrot and stick approach. We're going to punish you now, but if you take the punishment and you do the treatment and you're better, you can come back. If they take the the stick part, or sorry, the carrot part away from this, What's the reason that he has to get better? And what responsibility would the NHL then bear? This is a player that will never play again anyway. So what do they care? That's, a, that's an interesting debate on what responsibility does an employer have over someone's personal addiction? You know, yeah. is, is, the, is the employer, because that's what the NHL are, it's not, they don't, they're not responsible in a sense for Evander Kane's addiction. Like they didn't cause it. So uh, what's their role in rehabbing him? I don't know. I don't know what the question is. Well, if, 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 if he's if affected they weren't their responsible, business. They wouldn't have like Theo Fleury wouldn't have been through the substance abuse program three or four times. And we understand why that happened. Mm-hmm. But the reality was he was the most public person to go through it. All right. And but there isn't him. language in the CBA that says, hey, if you abuse alcohol, you're banned for life. So what's mm, the true. responsibility for the NHL if somebody breaks the rules and they also have the and they also have an addiction problem? Which what takes precedence as an employer? Is it the guy who's breaking the rules of your employment or is it just treating or helping this guy as a person? You know, I don't know. That's up to them to decide in whatever legal hole there is. Adam is thinking about this compassionately. And then there's also the, the business side of it. Like, for example, if a player were to have a cocaine problem, the league is not sponsored by cocaine. Exactly. There, there are no cocaine <laughs> sponsors going, hey, this really? is really ruining cocaine's image, right? But sports betting is about to be a very large thing, A, in this country, in mm-hmm. Canada, and it's also going to be a growing and much larger thing In the National Hockey League. Tomorrow, actually, the fact that you bring that up, tomorrow the Ontario government is announcing their plans for single-game betting. So you'll be able to find out tomorrow when you'll be able to bet on a Blue Jays game. So I I didn't... I I actually didn't know this until I was talking to someone on the phone today. So all the ways that we bet on, like, sports and everything, none of them are hosted in Canada? That's right. Exactly, yes. We've got... (laughs) Wow. Because well, whenever I hear about like, oh, yeah, I'm making sports betting legal, I'm like, isn't it? Not no. single game. Yeah. And the reason wow. for that is we had, we're a very, especially the East part of this country, very puritanical in that way. Like up until like 30 years ago, you couldn't shop on a Sunday. You couldn't, you still, can you buy alcohol on a Sunday? You can buy yes, alcohol yes. on a Sunday. Now, that's, yeah. that's, that's within the last 15 to 20 years. Yeah, Dude, when we were go kids, to the bank. Walmart wasn't open on Sundays when we were yep. kids. That's the bank. thing. You can't go to the, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, the bank wasn't open past 4 p.m. 
Yeah. We, got a, we have very we had very regressive puritanical laws when it came to alcohol and gambling. And you said to line up finally, out the door like everyone else. <laughs> you couldn't even you couldn't drink at the airport before noon. Like it's insane. And that's so the best part about the airport. Well, why can't you get a fucking drink if you want? Treat me like an adult. I'm an adult. And and so at the end of the day here, um, we are we're, we're you know, we're looking at gambling and sports books, as which is what they call it, as a, they are a fun way to spend your time. Like Jesse, especially you love doing that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. But it's managed and it's within reason, which right. is what 99.99999% of people do it for. It's a little bit of fun, a little spice on your, on your dinner. You know what it I mean? Makes, it makes fun. games more interesting is what yeah. I look at it. You know, when there's yeah. no dog in the fight, it gives you a dog in the fight. But just like anything, you can abuse it. Yeah. I hope the NHL treats this like, an, like every other addiction. And Steve, I think you make a really good point. Sports gambling, sports books are going to fund not only the NHL, but the NHL and sports media. You know, have a look at this. This business, guys, is about to change. And I don't think people realize how much sports books are going to fund some of the things that we've always loved, which ad- advertising used to fund it, but advertising isn't meeting that demand anymore. Um, and because there's crowded marketplaces, like, you know, it used to be, well, you, were, you buy either newspaper, billboard, radio, or television. Now it's like internet, internet, what app? You know, like it, there's so much crowding that gambling is very important for the, I think it's the Toronto Star. Their whole bet is that they're going to be able to save the newspaper based on their sports book. Mm-hmm. So they're going to fund journalism from gambling. Do you guys Crazy. remember when... Uh... Disney bought Fox and then one of the deals within Fox was that they had to they got to control all of those local sports networks. So remember the like Fox Sports Southeast and uh, Fox Sports Florida and like all the little Fox stations that host the like local Panthers games or whatever. And then Bally, which is a sports gambling um, organization, they came in and they bought all of the TV networks now that host all of these local regional games. And now all of these Fox sports networks are called Bally Sports, which is just a gambling company. And that's it. So they've already taken over TV in a large part of America. It's now this gambling book that owns the regional rights to whatever team you watch. And I think that's that's definitely the direction, like you're saying, Adam, that sports is going. Mm hmm. Absolutely. That's where the business is going. So it's, it's a very complex issue for the NHL, but on a human level, this is an addiction. Oh, yeah. Now, as far as showing up late for practice and all of the things, Kevin Kurz, you, I encourage you to read the article. I, you know, I always want to make sure that we're fair to the journalists here and don't read the whole damn thing. There's, there's connections to Timo Meyer here because that seems to be Evander Kane's only friend in the dressing room. Um, there is, uh, there's a lot of stuff you go, uh, culture, I guess, and this has been been really, really bad in, in the uh, Sharks organization here for the last few years. Um, you know, they, I, I guess here's what they said. Kane, uh, but Sharks displeasure with Kane stemmed from a general disrespect for team rules, including routinely being late for games and practices, not adhering to dress code and poor practice habits. At one point in the season, according to a source, Kane nearly came to blows with coach, assistant coach Rocky Thompson in a meeting after arguing where he was supposed to be positioned on the power play. So I, you know, it's, it's that stuff. I can't speak to that stuff. No one can. We don't know. We're not there. This is an addiction problem. And the NHL is going to have to figure this out because this gambling is going to be a huge part of the NHL going forward as it, as it would be in any sport. How are you going to deal with problematic gamblers? You're going to have problematic gamblers. If you run an organization with thousands of people employed, it won't just be the players. It'll be team it could Everybody. be team management. It could be anybody. You're going to have to figure out a policy for that. And I'm Which curious side, how they're going to handle it. What side do you guys land on? Do, if you have a guy who ruins the integrity of the game, of your sport, by betting on it, do you have a zero tolerance policy? Or is there some leeway for a rehab? What do you guys think? I, I'm, having, I'm having a hard time not looking at it the way Adam looks at it. But at the same time, like if you're, I don't know, X company, you're going to want something done here. You have to and do something. Is, is that something a timeout? Like it's a, it's a timeout. You got to take X amount of the season off f- as part of the rehabilitation process. 
And then you got to go through whatever amount of hoops to, I guess, satisfy them that, I don't know, you're better. I don't know. Like, Adam, you sound closer to this than, like, I've never really experienced addiction, mm-hmm. right? Like, even in, in, in or around me. Um, so, like, I don't know. How do you decide someone is, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, better? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this isn't a problem anymore. So you got to be able to satisfy the league that this is no longer a problem. And then he can resume games. Um, what I would say to that, Jesse, is there's never been a, a point in history where zero tolerance policies work. Hmm. Zero tolerance policies on any issue ever never work. They're a nice idea, but deterrence work to a point, but they don't work. Like you're, you're not going to just be like, well, we've solved the problem now. If that were the case, no one would ever kill anybody. Right. There's a zero tolerance for murder. All right there, Adam. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep, There's I mean, a zero tolerance for, for, for doing bad shit, for robbing banks. Totally. People will still do it. Uh, it's, so my point I, is, let's constrict, you know, it's, it's so fun and easy to say, well, just fucking ban them and move on. Sorry, guys. That's just not, unfortunately in life, problems are far more complex than that. And yes, I have dealt with addiction up close. It's ugly. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you, um, there's no fancy good answer for this that the public is going to like. If the NHL helps this guy, there's going to be people who are like, why the fuck would you help him? Um, and what then about the spread, Adam, I bet there would be three and a half goals that game. Yeah, and well, exactly. Yeah. And I'm that's not going to trust it anymore. You know, if <laughs> I, I think the instances of players that are going to be in this position are probably pretty rare. But you got to be very careful if you're the NHL about all of this. Um, and I think they already know that and they're probably drafting policy on that. Um, but yeah, j- the idea that, you know, like in the States, the death penalty is still legal in like half the States. Does that stop people from getting the death penalty for killing people? Never. It could t- they continue to have people on death row. So I guess the zero tolerance, zero tolerance policy doesn't work. And, and so my thing is, let's actively try to solve the problem rather than what I think a zero tolerance, tolerance policy is, which is um, now I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna write you off. Like, fuck you. And I, I understand why some people feel that way. I get it. But like, there's the three strike law. There's a few three strike laws and like California and stuff like that. I remember reading a book on this and like, you, you, it doesn't help anyone. You just, end up, you just end up fucking a bunch of people over where you could have helped them. And, you know, I think hundred years ago when we didn't have the tools the way we do now, maybe that made more sense. Just pull them off the street, pull them out of society. Um, and, uh, you know, pull Evander Kane out of hockey. Okay. But what have you really done? And I think the NHL has the opportunity here to help a human being out. Whether or not you think they deserve it, the point is they would help him out if he had a drug problem. They would help him out if he had an alcohol problem. They have to help him here. I don't know if you think that if, if you want to run an NHL that doesn't have take any active part in substance abuse or gambling issues, fine. You go be commissioner then. And when you're there, can't wait for that announcement. This but is in the cold. meantime, sorry, go ahead. This is cold. He is an extraordinarily unpopular player. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. He's a really unpopular player. Everywhere he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Has been for a long time. He's an unpopular player. So I think that adds to people's willingness to be like, yeah, just get rid of him. He's unpopular. You don't even like him. So of course, just just get rid of him and then he's gone. Imagine it happened to a player that you like. You know what I mean? Your favorite. Your your favorite player. Mm -hmm. Imagine it happened to your favorite player. Because not everyone uh, wears wears this on their sleeve. You know what I mean? Yeah. People tend not to wear their addictions on their sleeve. And anybody that has has dealt with addiction up close will tell you that people who are addicted could be normally great people who act like absolute fucking monsters. You know, whether it's alcohol or drugs or something else, they act, they act like absolute monsters. That's the problem with addiction. It isn't just the addiction itself. It's how you act around the addiction. So he might be unpopular or, and, and whatever else you want to call him because of this addiction. And if you don't go down the road of trying to help him, what have you done? Well, and just because he's unpopular doesn't mean he doesn't deserve help. Bingo. There you go. So, uh, uh, 
you know, I think, I think that the NHL is in a tough spot here, but they have a real opportunity to, to at least give this person an opportunity. Listen, if Evander Kane fucks this up, then that's on Evander Kane, right? If he doesn't show the receipts, if he doesn't go get help, he can't play this year, guys. I don't think he can play this year. Like, really? I, I mean, I know he's warming up or whatever, but like, we're like twenty million dollars in debt doesn't lie. Like, I, I, it sounds like we'll get an answer pretty soon. It sounds like it. Yeah, it sounds like it. And uh, and so it'd be very very interesting to watch. I don't think Evander Kane plays this year. If he comes back with the receipts, the treatment, the I was wrong and I was in a bad place and this and that, I'd be willing to listen to that. I think he's a. Sh- I think he's probably a shark throughout that process, and then he's dealt. Interesting. Fresh start. to who? I wonder. Yeah. Great we also we I, spent this entire segment on Kane, but like thoughts and prayers to his wife and uh, oh, their child, yeah. and no all because they're going through something. If yeah. she's taking it public and all that, you know, we don't know the details obviously and in the full story, but yeah, there's a lot of trouble there. So, yeah. Thoughts I'm not. I'm not surprised that that she felt like there was nowhere to go. Based mm-hmm. on what we know about the Blackhawks situation, it's not like the NHL's got a really good. Um, I read a book about. Um, it's going to sound weird, but I read a book about Ford, and the the car the car things, manufacturer. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Not, yeah. The car manufacturer. Rob. One of the things. Not Rob Ford. No. Or Doug. Uh, this what what they did was they stole an idea from Japan, which was on the assembly lines. If something was going wrong. The person, everybody on the assembly line was empowered to shut the assembly line down if there was a problem, right? To, 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 hey, there's a problem. You know, the other, the American motor car companies didn't have that. So if there was a problem, it just continued to perpetuate and the guys would be like, oh, fuck it, someone else's problem. And then the problem never gets solved. It sounds like in the NHL, there's no way to shut this down and go, there's a problem here. Imagine where you got to be in your life to post something like that about your husband the father of your two children on Instagram. You got to be desperate. You got to be brutally upset. Yeah. Your life has got to be hell to be able to do that. You married this person. You committed your life to this person. And as somebody who's been through a divorce, I know what that's like too, where you're like, holy, not, not publicly posting anything, but we're talking about a split here. It's brutal. So I, I also feel tremendous empathy towards her because like, holy shit. The... I think the way a league is supposed to run is the way a bowling alley is supposed to run. The there's a line you, you can't cross when you throw the ball. Mm-hmm. There's two gutters that prevent the ball from going here, there and everywhere. Mm-hmm. There's some pins at the end and then the ball and the pins go into this nice little opening at the back. And it just feels like the NHL is just playing bowl. It's, it's just bowling in a parking lot. There's, there's no restrictions. There's no order to anything. How many conversations have we had recently about a variety of different topics? And we're just like, oh, they don't have a policy for that. Yeah. They don't have a, they don't have a plan for that. They don't have a fail safe for that, but I'm supposed to take you seriously. You're a big time league. Come on. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. This, this summer, if nothing else for the NHL has been a great learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the Players Association, too. They wear this, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. There are not enough fail-safes in this league. Yes, that's the word, fail-safe. I couldn't find it. Exactly that, Steve. Well done. Um, I do want to say, I want to point out one funny uh, tweet here, just to completely change the subject. Um, guys. Do it. It's a big day in Buffalo. Did you know that? No. Have you seen this tweet? No. It's a big day in Buffalo. Why would it be, St- Jesse, don't look it up. Why would it be a big day in for the Buffalo Sabres August in Buffalo, 11? not even in Buffalo. Sorry, not even in, in the Sabres organization. It's a big day for Buffalo. Bills news. Well, the Sabres tweeted it out, but it's a big day in Buffalo, not just in the Sabres organization. Okay. Uh, I saw Owen Powers probably not gonna. He's gonna go back to school. No. That's not good news. Well, oh really? Yeah. Uh, I think it is good news. They're good for good for Owen Power. Yeah, it's yeah. good for him. No, they're going to be bad, man. Like, yeah, they're going to suck. Um, I have no idea, Adam. It's Coach Don Granado's birthday, guys. 
Hey! Big day in Buffalo. Big, well, big day. Well, all things considered, <laughs> the responses to it are pretty amazing. <laughs> what? I thought he was actually popular in Buffalo. Yeah, but people are like, it's a big day in Buffalo. Like, what do you mean? And oh, that's, like, that's what the tweet says. That's what the tweet says. The tweet uh, says it's a big day in Buffalo. Happy uh, birthday, Donnie G. Uh, I thought you were being a jerk. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's what they tweeted. Okay. Big day. <laughs> I didn't get big it. Big day. Oh. And <laughs> Bless that Twitter person, too. What do yeah. you suppose? supposed to do i love the first response it's a big day in buffalo wishes the coach a happy birthday so you guys are just trolling us at this point right oh man that's tough and then somebody (laughs) somebody posted a picture with jack or jack eichel said and said this guy doesn't care (laughs) boy that's me one of one of the best hockey not actually hockey podcasts i've listened to recently was 31 thoughts american fridge had the surgeon who Eichel wants to do surgery on him. Fascinating. Okay. Can, you, give fa- a, can you sum it up in a tweet? What would you say about it? <laughs> Don't, without giving it away. He explains the procedure exactly and any concerns around it and why timing is so important here. Very interesting. That was under 280 characters. Go check out 31 Thoughts. We love those boys. They've been so good to us. Um and uh short listen to it's like half an hour well, it's a uh, uh, it's it's an interesting time in buffalo isn't it <laughs> just great it's a great now, day in buffalo uh it's a great it's a huge day in buffalo great now day. i want to quickly do sarah volley and then we're going to do jesse's list it's the return of jesse's list um but we're not getting to that quite yet i'm going to do, i'm going to take five minutes on frank sarah volley and then we're going to get to jesse's list and jesse your list is what the top six Stanley Cup winners since the 0405 lockout. Okay, this is great. I like I like that he chose top six. Um, now, okay. So here's the interesting part here. So when the NHL signed, when they had a uh, collective bargaining agreement uh, that was signed after the 2003 2004 lockout or whatever it was or 0405 whatever it was. I don't think enough has been made and there needs to be an entire podcast series on just how badly the stars of that era screwed the, the, the players that we're going to play 10, 15, 20 years from now. I don't think we understand. Like we had players making 10 to $12 million in 2004 who are making three and four after that, after that lockout. We just now have players making over 10 and we think that's crazy in most cases, except for Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid in the NHL, of, if the NHL continued the way it was going, Connor McDavid would have been like a $20 million player and he would have been worth it. And it's crazy because I'm not sure if you're aware, the NHL players are in debt to the owners right now, $1.3 billion. I... I don't know what that means. Yeah. Remember Kipper came on and he explained escrow and yeah. I was like, yeah, man, I get it. I didn't get it. So basically what they agreed to was a 50, 50 split. And what that means is 50% of the revenue goes to the players. 50% of the revenue goes to the owners. That was the 50, 50 split. The escrow is on top of taxes, something that is skimmed off of your paycheck every month. And the escrow can be 10%, it can be 20%, it can be 30%. It's agreed on beforehand. Skimmed off your paycheck that they hold on to until the end of the season to see how much money they have to pay the owners back to even out the 50-50 split. So they have to make sure because, you know, you might be paying, paying the players a certain amount of money, right? If at the end of the season, it's not a 50-50 split, the owners have haven't gotten their fair share of the 50-50, then they need to claw back money from the players. So the escrow, in essence, keeps the money in a third pot that the owners can then draw upon if the 50-50 revenue split hasn't been hit. And what happened this year and last year during the bubbles and you know all the other restrictions with COVID is that the owners took a huge loss. Mm-hmm. Huge loss. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. Now, we can debate whether or not that's actually a good thing for them because they can, they're billionaires and they can hide assets in a money-losing team, which they can. 
huge tax write-offs. Huge. Losing money just means you have to pay less taxes. Hint, Bingo. hint. It's Bingo. a good thing. You the want to lose money. Like the owners made out like bandits. Yeah, that makes sense. In the last two yeah. it, oh, collective bargaining agreements. It's actually ridiculous. It's crazy. No one gets into this, but it's fucking crazy. So now the players got paid their salaries, but the owners lost a pile of money on paper, right? On paper. They lost a pile of money. So the players have to pay the owners back. And this is why the salary cap, which every, every time I bring this up, people get mad at me. The hard salary cap will remain basically the same for the next five to seven years. Now, I'm going to read a, a quote from Frank's article. It's on Daily Face Off, Frank Cervalli. Please check this out. It was published August 5th, and it's called NHL Salary Cap Projected to Rise to $82.5 million in 2022-2023. A rise in 2022-2023 would likely trigger the start of a lag formula as agreed upon by the collective bargaining agreement negotiations between the NHL and the NHLPA in 2020 that could see the salary climb to 1 million each off season until the escrow balance to the owners is paid off. Meaning that the owners take a loss in the interim, the players pay them off with their salaries over the course of five to seven years. According to league sources, the NHL is projecting a hockey related revenue of $4.8 billion dollars for the upcoming season. Given that figure includes increased revenue from gener uh, ge generated from two new US rights deals, TNT and Warner, uh, sorry, TNT, Warner, and of course, Walt Disney with ESPN, plus the juice from a new cat Kraken club uh, that would likely be in the top part of the revenue. So the pre-pandemic pace, by the way, guys, was 4.9 billion. So they're not expecting to make what they were making in 2019. And the new one's what, 4.8? 4.8. So that's what they're, they're expecting a rebound to 2019 levels, but we're now three seasons away from that, right? They were expected to be much higher at this point. That's why the cap can't go up. In addition, sources say that the escrow balance owed by players to the owners is in the ballpark of a billion following last season, though the exact figure is still being computed uh, following the final 2021, sorry, 2020 and 2021 accounting. Uh, according to a calculation run by Daily Faceoff, NHL players are projected to increase the balance owed to owners in the 21-22 season, not even begin to pay it off because the $4.8 billion in revenue uh, in their projected salaries are likely to be significantly exceeding the allotment of 50-50. So here's the thing. I know that was a lot of technical jargon, but here's the number you need to know. For this to be a 50-50 split like they agreed upon, NHL player salaries are projected to be $2.9 billion in total this next season. Their 50-50 allotted share is 2.4 billion. You're like, well, 2.9, 2.4, that's $500 million. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. So that means, and Frank put together an incredible chart here. Uh, I highly suggest you check this out. 2021-22, which is what we're heading into, projected revenue is 4.8 billion. The ending escrow balance would be $1.3 billion. That's what you owe. And the players will have to pay this off probably until the 2024-25 season. In that time, you're going to see the salary cap raise a million dollars. So it'll be 81.5 this year, 82.5 the next, 83.5 the next, 84.5 in 24-25. And at that point, in that point only, according to the daily face-off calculator, only then will there be a chance that this is paid off. And what that means is, Salary cap can't go up until that's paid off, which means that each team that you see, like this is why Ron Francis is pretty smart, built his team around a lot of cap space yep. because it ain't going anywhere now ever. <laughs> well, okay. So here's the, the, the frustrating part as a fan, you want to see the salary cap go up. You want to see movement. The only reason we see movement each off season, most of the time is because you're seeing uh, you know, you're seeing increased value in clubs and they can spend more money and move people around. With the hard cap the way it is, the NHL uh, general managers are not going to be able to do that the same way. You're going to see a lot more like, well, this person's bought out and here's an obscenely ridiculous mathematical calculation to get it done. The, yes. the next time we expect the cup or the, the, the balance to go up by a million or two million or three million is 26, 27. <laughs> Whoever 
this is complete hindsight, obviously, but whoever negotiated the last deal to have this as the structure, it's oof, it's not looking great. This deal was negotiated in 2020. This deal and beyond before that, the 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 the, the foundation of this deal happened in the 0405 lockout. Right. Gary Bettman said we are not playing hockey until we get this deal. <sighs> the owners won. The owners Dude, won. Yeah, the, the NHLPA is it's the worst union in sports. <laughs> well, no, the NHL the the NFL PA is pretty pretty yeah. Bad, but at least yeah, because the NFL even, you could go you could go get a concussion, your career is over, and they're like, all right, we're paying you zero dollars. Oh they, yeah. Oh yeah, they also, do have guaranteed. Oh yeah, no, you yeah, have guaranteed, guaranteed right. contracts. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> they can just cut you. Um uh, but they that is but pretty big, eh? The <laughs> NFL broke the players union in the 80s. They broke them. Mm-hmm. They got them to split. And that was what was going to happen in 0405 had they not come to an agreement. The players basically, as much as people don't like Bob Good now, they basically turned on. They turned on their own guy and fucked themselves. And it's the players that were making big, big money that did it. You know, rookies in the NHL used to get two or three million dollar contracts. Now you have to wait three years to get anything more than, you know, you got rookie bonuses and stuff like that, but to get guaranteed money over a million bucks, you got to wait three years. That's you got to play 160 something, get 180 games or more 210 games or whatever it is. It's, it's insane. And so I, I just want to throw this out there that this, this hard cap, as much as it works great for the owners who, by the way, are going to see their product value and equity rise enormously in the next five years, enormously because of these TV deals, because of, you know, people coming back to stadiums, entertainment being more important than ever. The billionaires are winning here. The players are getting completely screwed and it's the hard cap that's doing it. Don't tell me that these guys in small market situations aren't making a fucking killing off this because they are. If you're looking at a balance sheet season to season, who cares? Unless you're a billionaire that can't afford this anymore, i.e. Eugene Melnick, really, allegedly. There you go. Most of these guys- Oh, I was just are, in Ottawa. Let me tell you, popular guy. No, I'm sure. Most of these guys are making an absolute killing off of COVID because they're able to hide assets. They don't, all that money that would have gone to the tax treasury, well, no, it's, well, we've got to write this off. We've got to write that off. Guys, this is criminal. And I don't know, I think it's bad for the game. I think the hard cap is one of the worst things that's ever happened in the NHL. And so what if we would have lost a couple franchises? Oh, but who cares? (laughs) Like, honestly, it's like, well, we would have lost two to three franchises. Who fucking cares? Not a problem anymore. Well, all the fans in those markets. Okay, so we would have lost the Coyotes. Why? Hey. That's who we would have lost. We probably would have lost the Panthers. I mean, we're, these are not Six. markets that, and, and also we're not in that, we're not in that place anymore. That's the other thing that people don't understand is that was 20 years ago. We are now expanding. This is going to be 32 NHL teams and they're all, yes, they're going to lose money, but they're all gaining. They're all gaining. Equity is huge. Don't underestimate it. And it's ridiculous that the players like, you know, that we, we get mad at Matthews and Marner for making 11 million bucks against, oh, they're selfish. Who's the selfish one in this equation, really? Really? Oh, like, I understand the argument. And, and this, believe me, I got this yelled at me a lot throughout the Mitch Marner negotiations, is why are you cheering for MLSC? Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not like, keep your money! Yeah! <laughs> Let's go! Bell and Rogers, and let's let's go. Yeah. If only they had something break their way. <laughs> Come on, Larry, Larry, ten and bomb, ten. It's I'm gonna take out Toronto Maple Leafs, and I'm gonna get a custom made leaf that says ten and bomb, because that's who I'm really cheering for. It's not about that. I'd rather the individual get the money than the massive organization. But the reality is, there's a salary cap. And if a guy eats up too much of it, it makes the team I cheer for bad. So I, that was the logic. That was and, the logic, but and the funny you're right. Is, you are but, right. But if you had a luxury tax, this wouldn't change the thing that matters the most to the owners, which is equity. It wouldn't make the league worse. It would make it better. 
It would make there it has more to be exciting. a reason they're doing this though. Because they have control. They can artificially control this. Is it greed? Yes. Of course it's greed. And if you look at the NBA owners, the, they, they, none of them seem hurting. They're okay. Yeah, because they make like tenfold the NHL owners. Right. And the NHL has, listen, Gary Bettman's done great for the NHL owners. There's no question. You might hate him, but he's done great for them. But they have missed the boat on a lot of big things. And the excitement of trade deadline and free agency being a fucking dud every year, although this free agency was pretty spectacular. This was ridiculous, yes. But, you know, how many trade deadlines in a row do we go, oh, we got 14 moves. And a lot of them are for seventh round picks. Oh. Many, many, many. I remember the trade deadline just before COVID. The big move of the day, I want to say, was like Kevin Hayes or something like that. And we were like, woo. Kasha moved for a first. This is Andre Kasha. This is what I'm saying. So sure. uh, I think it would be better for the owners and better for the players. Players make a little bit more money. A lot more money changes hands. And I don't know if you know how capitalism works, but uh, the more money moves, the better it gets. That's the whole point. So it's a it's a shame that uh, it's a shame that we're in this position because what we're just going to end up seeing is players losing money. They're going to get bought out. And if you're pro player and you're pro union, you should be pro luxury tax to hard cap. If you are pro player and you are pro union, that's what you should be pro. So whereas there's if you're pro hard cap, then you are pro owner. That's what it is. And it, there needs to be a luxury tax that kicks in. And, and then there needs to be a hard cap on top of that. That's what and, and that's what you say. Mm-hmm. And all the decision makers and richest people involved go, nope. And <laughs> well, they move that, on. Because and it's that's the end of the conversation. I know. Yeah. It, Buck I know. stops there. Yeah. This is, uh, this, is, this is a good cardio exercise for you, Adam. It's good mm-hmm. cardiovascular, you know. But it's, it means dick all. Right. Nothing. Yeah, I know. I know. It's so oh, it's frustrating though. I know. Believe me, I yell about how I would make the Leafs better every year. I I know a fruitless argument when you I d- see one. You do it after every game. <laughs> now here's what they need to do. Today's episode is sponsored by the NBA and their quest to advance the game of basketball, grow the community, and impact culture. The league celebrates its teams, players, and fans across the past, present, and future as part of its 75th anniversary season. That's game highlights pivotal moments on court and beyond from iconic plays in arenas to the impact players have in the communities. That's the NBA. That's game. Like, for instance, the NBA Finals, when the Bucs had their back against the wall, Drew Holiday steals the ball, pushes back, alley-oop to Giannis, iconic slam, seals game five, eventual title. That's the NBA. That's game. Or... If you're a Raptors fan, the Kawhi shot, that's the NBA. That's game. This is more than just basketball. It's what connects us all and keeps us coming back for more. That's the NBA. That's game. Sign up today with BetMGM, the exclusive betting partner of The Athletic, and get $1,000 in a risk-free bet plus a three-month subscription to The Athletic. Just sign up at BetMGM.com slash 2 T-W-O-P-O-D, to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. That's BetMGM.com slash 2 T-W-O-P-O-D. That's a new customer offer. Paid in bonus dollars. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. This episode is brought to you by Rise, a science-based app that makes it easy to improve your sleep and increase your daily energy. Now, for me, I can tell you that sleep's really important. Get up early in the morning for a morning show, have to do this podcast in the afternoon. These are long days. And for the longest time, I used to do research on like how to sleep better. And all I could find was stuff on like, if you can't breathe when you sleep, which is also important, you might want to have that. However, sometimes we just want to maximize our best sleep. And Rise uses a scientific fact-based approach to help you get the sleep your body needs. It's built around the two principles that sleep researchers agree most affect how we feel and perform, sleep debt and circadian rhythm. Sleep debt is the only sleep score that matters. Rise tracks how much sleep you owe your body, 
relative to your own unique sleep needs and helps you pay it back. Your circadian rhythm dictates your personal energy peaks and dips throughout the day. Rise not only predicts your daily energy schedule, but it helps you take control of it. Rise helps you realize your potential with real results, real productivity, real performance, and real well-being. Go to risescience.com slash STP and download the Rise app today and try it for free for seven days. Most Rise users feel its benefits in just five days. So give it a try today and learn more about your sleep and your energy, plus feel better, all during the free trial. Whether you want to become a morning person, be less exhausted during the day, or improve your productivity and daily energy, Rise is the power behind your next day. That's risescience.com slash STP to try the Rise app for free for seven days. Now let's get into some fun. Jesse has what he believes to be the top Stanley Cup winning teams since the, prompt, uh, uh, interestingly enough, since the 0405 lockout. Okay. Here, can I, can I just, here are the candidates, right? In case you forgot who Please. won all the cups. You're going to read, okay, so there's 16 Stanley Cup champions. You're going to go through them all. 2006 Hurricanes, 2007 Ducks, 2008 Red Wings, 2009 Penguins, 2010 Blackhawks, 2011 Bruins, 2012 Kings, 2013 Blackhawks, 2014 Kings, 2015 Blackhawks, 2016 Pens, 2017 Pens, 2018 Capitals, 2019 Blues, 2020 Bolts, and 2021 Bolts. That is a nice shirt, Jesse. Okay, Jesse. Those are the candidates. Give us your list. All right. Top six Stanley Cup. I landed on top six because I ranked like the top 10 ish and I landed on a definitive top six in that. Mm. I don't think the seventh team could squeak in. And I think this is the definitive top bunch of teams. So it's in order. We'll start at the very top. Or do you want to go six to one? Go six six to one. one. Six to one. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it that way. Pittsburgh Penguins, 15, 16. Interesting. They land at number six. A lot of um, there's you'll you'll see some consistent criteria amongst these teams. Some of it is uh, regular season success played a huge factor in my list. Playoff dominance, huge factor. Those I think those are the two things I built this like a month ago when we talked about it. So I'm trying to remember all of the uh, the notes I made here. But um, the 15, 16 Penguins, if you remember correctly, uh, they had a 15, 10, and 3 record on December 12th. They fire their head coach, Mike Johnston. They replace him with the other Mike, Mike Sullivan. I'm surprised it, their record was that good. I thought it was worse. I right? thought it was worse, too. And remember, our hot take at the time was Jim Rutherford needs to go. <laughs> yep. Yep. I remember. Oh, yeah. I remember. Woo! So the, the, they land at 6 on this list because they didn't steamroll uh, their opponents in the playoffs, but they only had to play one game seven, and that was versus Tampa in the second round. Mm-hmm. Uh, these were the Murray, the Matt Murray rookie playoffs, if you remember. Yep. Uh, he started more games in the playoffs than he did in the entire regular season. He had a 923 save percentage. This is the Phil Kessel Stanley Cups when he was yep. robbed of a Conn Smythe trophy because yep. he had to give it to Sidney Crosby. Um, 10 goals, 12 assists, 22 points. That compares to Crosby's 19 points. Notable uh, names from those teams, Crosby, Malkin, Kessel, Latang, Kunitz, Shiri, Rust, Benino, Haglin. It was the HBK year as It was well. the Benino, Benino, Benino. Benino, yeah. that was, that game was one. the ball. Yep. Oh, oh, that was great. Um, it was a you fun know what, run. You know what else I remember about that? I believe it was ESPN. Not a single analyst picked the Penguins. Wow. They all picked the Sharks. Yeah, but I mean, we'd had to have, ESPN had to be covering hockey at that time, which they decidedly were not. Mm, fair, yeah. fair. So when you compare this team at number six to the other teams, remember that their third line was their best line. Mm-hmm. Like that HBK line was their best line in that playoffs. So imagine having a team so stacked that your third line is your best offensive line. So that's the f- on it. 15, 16 Penguins coming in at number six. Now, number five, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the description of the team because you remember them uh, very well because at number five is the 2020, 2021 Tampa Bay Lightning. The ability to be the best offensive team on the ice or the best shutdown team on the ice at any moment, depending on whatever you needed on that very night, is why they land at number uh, number, uh, five here. They could have a 6-4 victory or they could have a 1-0 victory. 1-0 victories, which they did very often, surprisingly, throughout this last playoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, 
they didn't have a dominant run, I'd say, as compared to like the top uh, four teams that, that we're going to get to. But that's why they come in at number five, because they were such a strong team. But they, they had a lot of trouble versus the Islanders, who I had ranked as the second best team in the playoffs when we did those other rankings. Um, they played in the best division in hockey during the re- regular season. They finished in third behind Carolina, Carolina and Florida, if you remember that. And then um, notable names. You, you all know them. Kucherov, Point, Stamkos, Hedman, McDonough, Vasilevsky. We could run them all down the list. That's number five. Number four, 2011-2012 Los Angeles Kings. Interesting. They fu- A lot of similarities to Pittsburgh. They mm-hmm. fire their head coach on December 12th, mm-hmm. the exact same day that Pittsburgh, a couple of years later, fired their head coach. Um, they fired Terry Murray. They named John Stevens interim head coach. And then on the 20th, they hired Daryl Sutter to be their head coach, uh, replacing Stevens. That f- the final month of their season in the top three teams, you'll see this trend as well. It starts here with the uh, Kings. The final month of the season, they go 12, four and three dominant Jeff Carter with Jeff Carter leaving the way. Um, they have the most dominant playoff run uh, in the cap era. But a regular, they were a regular season team that lost more games than they won. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think they went, they went 40, 27, and 15, which is 40 and 42, if you're counting the overtime losses as losses. Uh, they were hurt during the regular season. They had no scoring. And at the trade deadline, if you remember, or just before the trade line, they trade for Jeff Carter. Greatest midseason trade of the cap era. I oh, think that's that's what I put without here. question. I think like there's no I don't know how you debate it if the team goes on to win the Stanley Cup and then this guy becomes your best player on the ice. Um, they lost. They were, four, they, they they were lose, like 11th place team in the conference. They were terrible. Yeah, it was crazy. They lose four games in total in the playoffs and two of the games were after they took a 3-0 lead. So, so of the four games, they were already up 3-0 in the series and they lose another. Uh, notable names from those teams, Carter, Quick, Dowdy, Dustin Brown, Dustin Penner, uh, Kopitar, Mike oh. Richards, Voinoff, Rob Skidari. Like You run down the list. These Kings teams were amazing. Um, I wrote this final note uh, at 10-10 of the first period uh, of the finals. New Jersey's uh, Steve Bernier was assessed a major boarding penalty and a game misconduct on a hit for Rob Skidari. The Kings then put the game out of reach by scoring three goals on the ensuing five-minute power play. So the power play... That. It's just there's as soon as you score, like it doesn't cancel. So they scored three goals on the full five minute uh, penalty. And if I was not mistaken, the Devils had won back to back games, too. Yeah, there was was a chance they were going to do the reverse sweep. Yeah, that was that was game six. And And that wrote it off. And the five the five minute major penalty ended the whole run by the by the Devils and the Kings went on to win the cup. Kovalchuk was unbelievable during that playoff run for the Devils. So was David Clarkson. So yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Funny. Yes, he was. And then the next year, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, number three, oh six, oh seven, Anaheim Ducks. <laughs> Shout out Brian Burke. Great Set team. an NHL record by earning at least one point in each of their first sixteen games in the regular season. They started off twelve zero and four, NHL record. Notable names on those teams, Geslav Perry, Solani, Chris Pronger, Niedemeyer, Jaguar, Brizgalov, Chris Kunitz, Dustin Penner. Two names that were on the list previously as well. Uh, this reason this team's at three is because no team except the two teams above them on the list were as dominant as them in the cap era in terms of regular season. Um, it was extremely boring cup run to the finals for them. If you remember the Ducks went four, one versus Minnesota four, one versus Vancouver four, two versus Detroit. There was the only kind of challenge. And then four, one versus Ottawa. It was like, it was boring because the Ducks mm-hmm. literally just went through the playoffs without a challenge. They get every series. Nothing goes to the limit. And then in the finals, uh, they, and then the three, one goal games in the, in the finals, is what I was looking for. So three, one goal games in the finals is super close for Ottawa, but it was never really close for the ducks because they ended up just winning as they did every other series. And that's when Eugene was a hero in Ottawa. Cause he'd save them. Right. Oh, people forget time changes stuff. There's a few names on this list already where time changes stuff significantly. Yeah. Number two, the 12, 13 Chicago Blackhawks. They won the president's trophy. The only 
team besides the top team on this list to win the president's trophy and then win the Stanley cup. When I was doing the research for this, for this little list here, I, I realized how rare it was for the best regular season team to also go on and win the Stanley cup. So the two teams at the top of this list did that very thing. The Blackhawks went 21, Oh, and three. Do you know how ridiculous that is to do that in a hockey season? It was ridiculous. Like, cause it was, it was, we were all just happy to be watching hockey again. And mm-hmm. I remember like, so it sort of flew under the radar because everyone was so obsessed with their own team. And then every now and then you check the standings and be like, uh, sorry, the Blackhawks haven't lost. Yeah. Didn't lose like, until the 25th game of the season. It was ridiculous. Amazing. So uh, their road to the Stanley cup, they, they took care of business uh, the wild, they beat them in the first round. Then they went down three, one to the red wings in the second round. They almost lost and they came back to win the series. Then they beat the Kings in five and the Kings. They beat in the finals that year. Do you, if you remember the Kings won the cup in 12 and 14. So I think the, out of anybody on this, uh, on this list, that's, that's probably the, the toughest opponent, opponent that any Stanley Cup champion has had. The Blackhawks facing the Kings in the semifinals. I think I said the finals. Of the semifinals of the Western Conference. Um, well, the Western Conference finals being the Kings there, who were the Stanley Cup champions in the sandwich two years before there. And then they go on to beat the Bruins in the final, who won the Cup two years prior. So the last three Stanley Cups, they beat the two teams who won those last three Stanley Cups. Well, and you- 17 seconds. Mm-hmm. 17 do you remember that about so it was game six the Bruins were on the verge of forcing game seven mm-hmm. in that series Brian Bickle scores with like a minute and a half or something like that to go to tie it and then Dave Boland scores 17 seconds later they win the cup unbelievable mm-hmm. it's amazing like how many cups were scored like with less than two minutes to go in the game. Obviously, Alec Martinez was overtime. There was this by Dave Boland, and there was also Patrick Hornquist in 2017. It was a 0-0 game with like a minute left, and he scores. And the Leafs were also obsessed with getting third-line pieces off of Stanley Cup winners. <sighs> Adam, I was having fun. Like, why did you... Why? Oh, no, it's, it started with, um, what was his name? Versteeg. Mm-hmm. And it was also Boland and Clarkson. Same year. Or so, yeah, they got them uh, the same. No, year. it was one one a year. You got to get one every year. Oh. <laughs> it was great. No, Bolin and Clarkson was same year. Same year. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So cool. at six, it was the 15 16 Penguins. At five, the 20 21 Lightning. Mm-hmm. At four, the 11 12 Kings. At three, the 06 07 Ducks. At two, the 12 13 Blackhawks. Can you guys tell me who's number one? I think you're going to say last year's lightning. Um, I, I don't know how you can't say last year's lightning. Um, so I'm going to also say, Steve, last year's lightning. You're both incorrect. Oh, the number one team on this list of the post lockout Stanley Cup champions is the 07 08 Detroit Red Wings. Oh, let me, let me tell you about this damn team. They're, Interesting. Besides the Blackhawks, they're the only other team to win the President's Troy Trophy and then win the Stanley Cup. Notable names on this roster. Satterberg, Datsu, Cronwall, Lindstrom, Phil Pula, Chris Draper, Osgood, backed up by Old Man Hashik. <laughs> Chris Je- Chelios played 14 playoff games, but not in the finals. <laughs> Oh, wow. From because, December, because Babs would have been like, no, yeah, no, cool. you can't do that. From November 24th to February 5th, they went 26, four and three. The regular season dominance is there. Um, they outshot Pittsburgh in every game of the Stanley Cup finals. And I bring up sh- the, the shots because they had 58 in game five. Did it go to overtime? That was a that was a triple OT game. Okay, that okay. Mark Andre Fleury stole by standing on his head. Pittsburgh like won. A, uh, yeah, Pittsburgh won. Oh my god! A triple OT game where they had fifty eight shots. The Red Wings did. Uh, the Wings never faced elimination. So unlike the Blackhawks, where they were down three one, and the Blackhawks come, the Wings they danced to the finals. They danced all the way to a victory, never facing elimination. Um, more impressively, in the Stanley Cup Finals, they never trailed. Mm-hmm. They never trailed in the games. Like it was, it was just, just lost this, two overtime games. 
uh, yeah, they lost. They lost the two overtime games, the triple OT one. And then the other one, I don't have it in front of me, which, which is the other game, but yeah, oh they never trailed there. And then uh, this is the icing on the cake. They almost repeated the next year, but lost yes. in game seven to Pittsburgh. This is my, this is the best team. I think of, of the post lockout. Interesting. The, very, the very interesting. Dave. Now I'm, I could run through my list super quick here. Steve, do you have your list ready? I sure do. Okay. Do you want to go? Sure. You go. Okay. So I have the 2007 Ducks as number six. Mm -hmm. They were a really influential team. Um, that team, I mean, people wanted Brian Burke because of that team. The Leafs. Um, yes. And Randy Carlisle, there, too. There was a conditional pick in the Chris Pronger trade from Edmonton to Anaheim. And I remember the conversation. I wish I could find the interview somewhere, but it was basically Kevin Lowe with the Oilers. Uh, just having a frank conversation with Burke. This was pre them wanting to fight in a barn. And he was like, you know, I'm just handing you a trip to the Stanley cup final. Right. And he goes, yeah. So they put a conditional pick in there. That was, if they made the Stanley cup final, you get another first. And that first ended up being, I believe Jordan Emberley. Oh, wow. I want to okay. say yes. So, but uh, they were unbelievable for all the reasons that Jesse said. Number five, I have the 2009 Penguins. Um, because the Mark Recchi Penguins. Oh yeah, uh, people forget that's where he got his third tattoo, I believe, because mm. he he has a tattoo for every with every team he's won with. Who's he got? He's got the Hurricanes. He's got the Penguins. I don't remember the. What, did he win with the Habs in '93? I think he might have when he was really young. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I don't. I don't remember. Anyway, um, so yeah, 2009 Penguins. Watching it live was such a great passing of the torch moment and you know you talk about having to overcome someone the penguins had to overcome the red wings but they didn't just have to overcome the red wings they had to overcome the red wings who had stolen one of their best pieces from the previous year in marion hosa mm -hmm. which marion hosa <laughs> after losing a back-to-back -back stanley cup finals decided i'm never doing that again and then he signed for a dozen years in chicago where he ended up winning three cups number four i have this year's lightning um, so regular season success, far less of a factor for me in, in my list. I just looked at the run, but the lightning this year, while they didn't dominate teams, when push came to shove in elimination games, they weren't losing. There was no shot of it. There's mm -hmm. no shot of it. Bless the Islanders. They were wonderful. Maybe even the second best team in hockey. There was no shot. Uh, Andre Vasilevsky in elimination games is simply the best goalie in the sport right now. Number tw uh, three, sorry, the 2012 LA Kings. Um, they were unbeatable uh, for like three months. <laughs> it, was, it was the lead up to the playoffs was wild. Um, they barely lost. They, they speed wobbled a bit in the Stanley Cup final, but they ended up shutting it down. Number two, 2013 Blackhawks. Jesse set that up extremely well. They were just dominant. And number one. The reason I called the 2019 Penguins a passing of the torch moment and the part of the reason the Ducks are on this list is because of the 28, uh, 2008 Detroit Red Wings. They were the standard, the standard for a really long time. And you look, you look, at, you look at the Kings teams that eventually developed. You looked at the um, Blues teams that did so well for so long and never quite made it. You look at the Sharks teams that did so well for so long and didn't really quite make it. The Red Wings fingerprints are mm -hmm. all over that. If you wanted to win the Stanley Cup, especially in the West, you had to go through them. And Jesse, you read that roster. Yeah. She's crazy. What on earth? Like how many Hall of Famers? Five? Six. What on earth do you do? Yeah, five so far. Like Chris Osgood's probably getting no, in, no, no. Right? that's it's way more than five. I think it's that seven, seven now. There you go. I'd be surprised. Yeah. Like, like, hold on. And like, how many Olympians? How many gold yeah. medalists? How many like Chris Draper and Kirk Maltby were Olympians? People, people forget <laughs> that, right? As like right. shutdown guys, because well, they knew it worked. You know, they didn't have to be the most skilled guys, but they're like, well, we need a fourth line, and we know they can do it against the best. Yep. So they had them. So, I mean, the goalie for the best team of the cap era was Chris Osgood. Go figure. You know? But uh, they were an unbelievable team. This was a really hard list. 
Um, one of the teams I badly wanted to add to this list was the 2011 Bruins, just because mm-hmm. they were one of my favorite stories of the cap era, but, and, and f- not just for what they were, but for what they influenced. Yes. They yes. ruined teams mentally for a long time. They ruined, they tore the Canucks dynasty down from the, <laughs> from the foundation, even though they went on to win the president's trophy the next year, what happened? They ran into the big Western Bruins, the, the even bigger Western version of the Bruins in the LA Kings and got steamrolled. Um, and then they never recovered. To this day, they haven't recovered. They've they've never reachieved. Yeah, that Stanley Cup final was just devastating for the Canucks organization and the mindset in there. Yeah, and it's so weird. The games it was a tight series, but the games that they lost, they weren't in. Mm-hmm. They didn't they lose one like eight two or something like that. They lost game seven four nothing on home ice. It was it was a very very strange series. But I feel like that team was influenced by the 20, the 2007 Ducks team. Mm-hmm. Kind of. So anyway, that's, that's my very long list. I like the 2011 Bruins, uh, Bruins edition. I think that's a really good one. Um, so it's, is it the 12, 13 Hawks? Is that how I, re- is that how the I lock, refer to the lockout Hawks? The lock Hawks. Yeah. Um, the Hawks were I'm going to give them monsters. <laughs> I'm going to give monsters. them the number six on my spot. Obviously they're monsters, obviously like just an incredible hockey team. Um, but I think you also have to remember the the insane stress that that lockout caused. So to come in and to win and to be as dominant as they were right off the top and all the way through the season, um, it's almost like what the New England Patriots were where they didn't lose a game until the Super Bowl, right? They were just that good. And this in this case, the Hawks won. So that's why they get number six on my list. Number six, sorry, number five is the 16 pens. And I think, you know, for all the reasons Jesse outlined, you're talking about firing a coach, you're talking about underachieving, you're talking about... Um, you know, getting Phil Kessel and it not working out all that great. And then all of a sudden, bang, this team explodes in January right. and never look back. Uh, 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 you know, nobody expected it like this. And then they've got some, some random goalie coming out of nowhere named Matt Murray. Who's this guy? You know? Uh, uh, yeah. Cause the, remember they replaced their number one goalie cause he got injured. Right? Mm-hmm. Like that's nuts. And Mark Andre Fleury is going to be in the hall of fame guys. Uh, at least I, oh, think yeah. So. Oh yeah. So, like, think about what happened with that team, the, the, the insane amount of things that had to go right, and they all did, and they did for two seasons. That's pretty sweet. That's, that's why I give that, that team the edge over the, the, the team that won the next year because um, that team was the blueprint, and then, of course, they just repeated against Nashville. Uh, absolutely loved uh, that series and being there, by the way. Um, 08 Detroit. Or is it 09? Uh, 08. 08. 08. You know, for all the for all the reasons that Jesse and Steve gave, all the Hall of Famers and that sort of thing. But the reason I have them not ranked in my top three is because of all those players. There are teams that had insane runs with players. Like I, I think you got to give Detroit's development system. I don't know how they had this direct line into Sweden where they were drafting guys out of the sixth and seventh round for so long that turned out to be super super good. Um, but that was sort of the last hurrah for that team. The teams in my top three, I believe, were teams that were put together by at least pretty, some pretty intelligent GM ship, shall we say, and kind of made the most of their weaknesses. De- that Detroit team is one of the last teams that I can remember that literally didn't have a weakness. Like even Chris Osgood, people give him a hard time. Chris Osgood wasn't a bad goalie. He was an average goalie. But that Detroit team did not have a weakness. They were not weak anywhere. And that's almost impossible to accomplish in the, in the salary cap era. So they're not going to get into the top four for that reason, but also they des- sorry, the top three for that reason. But they also deserve a huge mention because everybody after that for the next five, six years tried to emulate it. Um, my favorite team on the list by far is the 07 Ducks. I they loved that. Team. So fun. I they were loved, really fun. Loved, loved that team. It was such a shame the next year. And a year. bunch of assholes. And a bunch of assholes. But like, you know, even guys <laughs> like Travis Moen. Remember Travis Moen? Travis Moen. What a bastard he was to play against. Rob Niedemeyer, yes. Sammy Paulson. Yes. Yeah. Great penalty kill. Um, and, and what was interesting about that team for me was that like, they should have repeated. That team should have repeated. I think if you were to ask Scott Niedermeyer. But. If, no, they should have. They should but the have. Red Wings. But the Red Wings. But also, let's be honest, <laughs> right. Scott Niedermeyer retired and then came back and wasn't the same. Right? Mm. Like, that's what it was. He shouldn't have retired. 
I know you want to retire on top, but if you're going to retire on top, commit to that. But you didn't. And you came back and you weren't the same. And the sun was setting on JS Jaguar's dominance. And, yes. Yeah. But boy, that the was team a, below them on your list beat them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I just have to say, I, I love that 07 Ducks team. Yeah. I really genuinely, I watched every game of that run because the Leafs were, were missed the playoffs by, I think, a point that year um, with JS Oban. And I think, uh, or yeah. was that the year before? Yeah. Um, um, Anyway, it they did matter. miss by one point. I they don't remember if it was, it was like a new, new Jersey didn't start Brodeur and then the Leafs couldn't get in and everybody got mad at New Jersey. I'm like, Scott, no, this is the, this Scott is the Leafs fault. This is the Leafs fault. They <laughs> yep. should have won another fucking game. It's not New Jersey's fault. It's the Leafs fault. But anyway, <sighs> that, that team was just fun to watch. They were dominant everywhere. And man, Chris Pronger was unreal to watch. Uh, half the shit he did then would be illegal now, but still fun to watch. Uh, I did. I looked up a stat. Just just so stupid how good the 2013 Blackhawks were. So they had two goalies. Um, well, they had one goalie who played one game and lost. It was Carter Hutton. Mm-hmm. I do not remember him ever being a Blackhawk. Their starter and backup goalie had an identical goals against average, which to me helps tell you it, it's the team. Mm-hmm. As good as the goaltenders were, it's the team. Uh, they both had a one nine four goals against average under two it's two guys combining for 51 games. was that niemi or crawford that year that the starter was Corey crawford with a 926 save percentage and their backup with a 922 i forgot all about this ray emery right with a record yes. this is your backup remember the leafs couldn't get a point out of their backup oh i remember ray emery in 21 games, had a record of 17 and one. That's crazy. That's their backup. Yeah. 17 and one with a record, uh, a 17 and one with a 194 goals against average and a 922 save percentage, three shutouts. Um, you, you just simply don't have a chance. Mm-hmm. You don't have um, a chance. Number two on my list, if I can. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Yep. No, I'm surprised nobody mentioned this. The 2020 Tampa Bay Lightning. Guys, yes, we just... Did. Oh, wait, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I thought you, know, you were going 21. to. Yeah. 2020 Tampa Bay Lightning deserved the second place on this list. Not because, not because they weren't special. They were and are. You know, that core is pretty special. And we're going to look back on that and go, wow, that was pretty great. Um, there were a couple of stories that emerged out of this. I, I think people had this bullshit line last fall when the cup was, you know, cup run was happening, that this cup was an asterisk cup. Uh, this cup people, didn't... by people you mean mr cox oh yeah who cares <laughs> well there were oh, people I forgot there were, about that there were people that that you're right jesse i forgot that was him that sort yeah. of created that but there were uh there was a undercurrent of people like this this cup doesn't count it's bullshit um this was the hardest stanley cup personally to win uh and you Four saw Adam. teams you not me not for me no but like on a personal level Imagine like the further you get, the less time, like the longer you're away from your family, yeah. uh, the longer you don't get to see the people in your life that you love. And we saw teams like the Washington Capitals go, fuck it. We don't care. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, allegedly say, fuck it. We don't care. We had teams literally fold. The Leafs folded probably against their will. You had what we think in the caps was just a, a laissez-faire sort of attitude. They don't want to hang out at a hotel X for more than a week. Right. And hotel X is pretty nice. I don't know what their problem is, but no, but it's seriously, it's like, you know, you don't want to be away from your family. I get it. I get it. Yeah. The, the thing was the fact that this cup even happened is oh. a miracle. Yeah. It's oh. an absolute miracle. The fact that they did not have one positive COVID test throughout the entire situation, another miracle. The fact that Steven Stamco stepped on the ice at all in game three and scored Five shifts. Miracle. And the fact that you could keep 22, 23 guys that focused for that long and against a really tough Dallas team defensively. They were great. I think you got to give kudos to that. Nothing about 2020 was easy. And these guys were expected to perform at the top level. Yes, I know you play shinny with your buddies and that's cool. But playing hockey at an elite level isn't easy. I know that you like to play road hockey and you think that it's fun and you're going, well, these guys are just playing hockey. Uh, this Why are is you shitting bit... on people who play shitty? I got no problem with people who say play shitty, but it's the same people who will be like, I play shitty, but they'll be like, well, I like playing hockey. So it's easier. Give me a fucking break on this. Yeah. One. 
<laughs> like, give me a you shinny break. playing dick. Yeah, shinny dick. So I here's like what this. I would say. Here's what I'd say. The 2020 Cup was <laughs> on a off ice level the hardest Stanley Cup ever won. That's yeah. my opinion. It was in the middle of a pandemic. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. And that's why that team deserves to be that. Now, um, by that logic, they should be the number one team on the list, but I'm going to go with my favorite team. And my favorite team. The is 1967 Toronto. Sorry. The 2012 Los Angeles Kings. They were great. They yeah. were just spectacular to watch. What a fun run all the way through. And right, Jesse, you nailed it. Jeff Carter, baby. What a trade. So good. Oh. And, and, and I think a couple of years later when they won in 14, didn't they get Marion Gabrick too? And yeah. Yeah. And that was another great trade. But that 2012 team was, there was just something about them. You knew we were going into a lockout at that point, too. Like we knew it was, it was, we wasn't going to be hockey for a while. Not me. I was pretty sad about it. So enjoy this moment (laughs) while you have it. And they played, they played hockey that advanced stats guys would love and hockey that the old school peeps would love to. Mm hmm. It's just, it was the perfect balance. They were tough. They were mean. They could score. The games were grinding, but they were also fun and exciting. Jonathan Quick stood on his head. Had, I think Andrew Berkshire always says it perfectly about Jonathan Quick. He has about one good month a year, uh, or at least back then he did. And it's May. And, and it was May. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was the month that mattered. And he yeah. was unbelievable. Unbelievable. So uh, the, the 2012 Kings, absolutely my favorite run um, and the Ducks, of course, in that too. So maybe my list is a bit biased, but fuck it, it's my list. Yeah, so. and you can you can go look at Jeff Carter's individual stats from that mm-hmm. run, oh and they're God. they're not like mind blowing. But what you if you look at the split, the pre Jeff Carter Kings and the after, yeah, they're not the same team. Yep, yep, they're not. They're not even close. They were they were the first or second in the league in possession behind the Canucks, and then they took the Canucks in the first round and put their head in the toilet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wasn't close it got Vino fired didn't it i think it did yeah yeah Man, i, I still remember the shot dead. of him walking off the ice and i'm like there goes a fired guy wow he's done they it's just funny. won the president's trophy for the second consecutive year he's done it was interesting looking at the list of stanley cup champions since 05 06 because i don't none of them stand out as oh that team probably like the best team didn't really win that year there's like a couple cases where you're like, ah, how did that really happen? St. Louis, I think when you look back, you're like, oh, that was a little a quirky victory. You know, it, it, I'm surprised it, they didn't make your list because because you of how because so? of how you valued the regular season. Mm. Like, yes, they were last when the calendar rolled over, but then it was like it was like 2019 hit and you couldn't beat them. Yeah, because they were I forget how far out of the playoffs they were, but no team last. had come back. Yeah, 31st. no team had come from last to make the playoffs to win the Stanley Cup like St. Louis did. But I didn't. I just look at the other teams. I look at them as more dominant. And I don't know. I guess. I guess you look back now and you're like, okay, if they had, if they were the best team since that January run, their Stanley Cup victory makes a little more, more more sense in that context. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Probably flipped my mind on that. And like the Washington year, Washington probably des- definitely deserved it. Um, like, they all, they deserve all deserved it. it. Like, yeah, they, they, they all, all I mean, they all deserve it. But when you look, okay, the best team that regular season or that season overall, did they actually win the th- Stanley Cup? I in most we, cases, they did. I think the Caps would have been on all of our lists had they followed it up in 18. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not in 18. Uh, yeah, with 18 with a better, a better run. Does that make in sense? In 19. Yeah. Sorry, 19. 18, 19. 19. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, I was talking to Berkshire about this a long time ago. If you look at the list of cup champs, like since like 2000 or whatever, mm-hmm. and, and again, you see some of the dynasty teams that we went through, the one team that sticks out like a sore thumb, and they deserved it, they deserved it, but the one team that sticks out, you look at Carolina and you're like, what are you doing there? That's what I was about to bring up. That was, oh, there you go. But the reason I, I like, I'll be like, okay, Carolina is probably the one team that sticks out, but it was coming out of the lockout. Nobody really had an idea of, what anything is right they they okay they straight up weren't good they bought <laughs> no, they finished second in the east mm-hmm. well, they a good they, team they bought have no on paper though i'm saying they were okay. like some teams you know how they no they they a lot of their best players from that run i'm trying to find it uh did ottawa win the president's trophy that year um they did i want to say they did in 2007 when they played the ducks they were first or second, mm-hmm. but like Corey, 
I'm trying to think of who was who no, were their acquisitions did. because there's Corey Stillman. I don't remember if he was an acquisition of that team. Oh, you know what? No, sorry. It was Recky and Wait. They're two most like two of their most important guys were acquisitions, and they began they began those playoffs not just down two nothing in the first round to the Montreal Canadiens, but with their starter as Martin Gerber. <laughs> It was because he stunk that they switched to Cam Ward, who went on to win the Conn Smythe. Like nothing. Like yeah, they won and everything. They didn't. They didn't know they were going to win like that. Mm. Not uh, certainly not when the season began. They had no idea. Do you remember that year? The Hart Trophy winner was also traded mid-season. It was Joe Thornton. Joe Thornton was traded from the Bruins to the Sharks in the middle of the season, and, and then he what, won the Hart Trophy. You look at his stats, and you can see the logic of the Bruins going, okay, so he struggled before the lockout, and now he's shit hot to start the season with these new rules. So we're going we're gonna to sell high. And he went to the Sharks and got better. And I remember Chichu, the, the rocket race was Chichu Yager. And I remember <laughs> making. <laughs> wow! I remember making a bet with someone at high school. Adam, I remember making a bet. Chichu was like ten goals behind Yager or something like that. I was like, he's gonna catch him. But no, you're nuts. But he was scoring at such a, a, a monstrous. Let, let, me, let me go. Let me go find this. He was he was unstoppable, unstoppable. Because all he had to do, hey Jonathan, you know how you skate around the ice and everything. All right. Well, when you do that. I need you to do me a favor and make sure uh, your stick is also on the ice because the best passer in the sport is going to find you and he's going to he's going to make professional hockey look easy. Oh my oh my this is stupid. You're looking up his stats. Yeah, I'm it's looking fun, at okay. It's fun so, reminiscing about 20 we, years ago hockey. We do we do have to wrap very soon though. <laughs> yeah, oh no, no no, I'll do <laughs> I'll do it quick. So this is one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these are the seven games. This is probably where this conversation started with my friend. The final seven games of the season. Chichu, who I believe ended with 56 goals. So he wasn't even at 50 yet. Two goals, one goal, two goals, zero goals, two goals, hat trick, zero goals. <laughs> 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 he ended the season slightly hot, slightly hot. He was pretty good, Jonathan Chichu. And that was all Thornton. That second last game of the season, by the way, five points. Can, I, <laughs> can I say two things before we go? Okay, because we really got to go. No! Before, before everyone yells at me, I read my stat about the Red Wings. Long. They didn't trail. They trailed in the series with Pittsburgh. They never trailed in a series in the playoffs. I just okay. I oh, missed said that. Okay. Uh, okay. They never trailed in a series. And um twitch.tv slash sdpn live is a new thing we got going we are now on twitch search sdpn live i think you guys i'm going to tell you right now on the show 4 30 on friday 4 30 p.m eastern every friday for the next four fridays till the till the end of the summer we're gonna do 4 30 p.m eastern on fridays can you gentlemen join me this week I, I don't know how, but sure. I don't. I don't know. I think so. Maybe. <laughs> I don't, we'll have to check. I don't okay. know. I'll, I'll have to check. All right. All right. Well, I I asked you on the show. Spring this yeah, on me in front of thousands of people. Yeah. On the show. So, My answer to that is. So if you want to see live uh, SDPN content, uh, I'll be there at least. I don't know if my friends are going to join me. Oh, but I think this de- will play depending on what games uh, the people are there. But uh, on yesterday. We did our first ever Twitch stream. I played GTA five for the first time ever. I I've never played GTA. Oh, it's so, fun. You yeah, it came out in 20. 20- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could tell. I didn't know how to shoot. So it was the first time ever playing GTA. It's fun. You can watch back the live stream on our YouTube channel. Every time we do a live stream on Fridays going forward, you'll be able to watch it on the YouTube channel like a couple hours afterwards after the live stream is done. So can I just kick off a, a, a stream from my like PS five anytime? So no. You, I don't think you can right now. If we hook you up with some technology and stuff, we can probably get it going for you. But on Friday, I'll show you how to join me and uh, we'll play some games if you guys are free. Sick. Because I want to do some F1 because I am bought F1 and I'm getting my PS5 back and I'm really excited. F1 with a guy who doesn't give one F. It's Adam Wilde <laughs> watching. <laughs> All right. Can we wrap it up, gentlemen? No.
Twitch.tv slash SDPN live. Go there. Jonathan Chichu in 2006. Oh my God. Okay. 2006. All right. We'll see you in three weeks. You know, August, really you so much. We really love you. We'll see you August 31st. Have a fantastic rest of your summer. And when we come back, it's back to business. It'll be a one episode. And then every week after that, mm. two episodes. It's two episodes that week. Oh, it is two episodes that yeah, week. Yeah. Then I'm an idiot. Then we're yeah. back to two episodes a week. So there you go. You have to excuse my friend Adam. It's his first week. Okay. We're the 31st and the second. We go Tuesday, Thursday when we come back. All right. It's been a great break for three fucking seconds. Let's go. <laughs> Let's fucking go all the way through to the July 1st next year. Yep. All right. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you for our first two week ep- two a week episode and the 30th of August, 31st of August. Love you. It's really good. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.